Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. Our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb, we are bound to others, past and present. And by each crime and every kindness, we birth our podcast. What, what even? What word is even being replaced there? Future. Uh. Uh, it's <laughs> the, the, the speech Sonmi gives. I was looking for a different one. I couldn't find it. Mm. Uh, the IMDb uh, a quote section for Cloud Atlas is. Uh, it's under under valued. Sparse for a movie that's three hours long. <laughs> and and well, two hours and fifty two minutes. Okay, not the most quotable movie. I don't know. I was looking. There's the thing. There's the thing that uh, uh, Tom Hanks says to Halle Berry, on the sort of when they're on the uh, on the mountain, on the volcano, or whatever. No, no, no. no. In the Louisa Ray oh, mystery. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. When he's like, we haven't met before, but yet I feel like I don't know. Anyway, hi. My name is Griffin Newman. I'm David Sims. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. Correct. This is the Podchowski Casters. Good. How can it be two things? <laughs> Because because that's how this podcast like works, American guys. Horror Story. <laughs> there is an overarching franchise, and then there are separate mini series. It's kind of like nesting dolls, kind yeah. of like the novel Cloud Atlas, but not the film Cloud Atlas. No, because uh, we wanna we wanna be able to compete in the mini series category at the at the podcast awards. Right, you know, yeah, yeah, not yeah, against yeah. like a dramatic uh, podcasting. What, 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 oh, did you just try to say dramatic and say dramatic? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Fuck me. I'm, I'm really tired. Guys, it's, uh, it's a Saturday afternoon. I ate Chick fil A for breakfast. Yeah. Uh, I'm drinking a, a vitamin water, and we are here. You said it like a British person. I thought it was funny. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. No, I no, might... It's fine. Um, we're here to talk about, uh, the fifth, sixth movie. The sixth Wachowski's movie? The sixth yeah, w- yeah, Wachowski yeah. joint. Mm hmm. Uh, it's a motion picture called Cloud Atlas. Yes, it's a film they co-directed. With Tom Tviker. Mm-hmm. Uh, he of Run, Lola, Run. Mm-hmm. And uh, a hologram for the king fame. You just saw that we were just talking about that yesterday. I haven't seen that. Have you seen that? No. no I read no. the book. I like the book. Mm-hmm. Give it a gentleman's B-. He, 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 he made what did he make? He made, like, uh, Perfume, the Story of a Murderer? Yeah, he, which I think is where he got Wishaw from yes. for this movie. Uh, yeah. The International is that what it was called? The one with Naomi Watts and Clive Owen. Oh yeah, where it's like banks. That was his big American uh, Guggenheim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Guggenheim uh, chase. Uh, that was the poster. Was them in the Guggenheim? Uh, yeah, that one kind of came and went. Yeah, uh, well, after Run the Lower and all his stuff kind of came and went. You know, we're here to talk about Cloud Atlas, and boy, and, uh, and we have a guest. We have. I'm a, really getting sidetracked. A guest of all guests. Uh, yes, he's he's a great man. Uh, a friend. Uh, we met on Twitter, mm-hmm. and then we decided to go meet up at a bar, and we talked for like eight hours about movies. Like four hours. Four. It was. It may it have been actually long. four hours. What, yeah. Which bar? Uh, it was my it was like under an overpass. It was like a. It was a very strange bar. It's a bar I love that they've it, they've ruined a little bit. It In used to City? be really gross, and now it's really gross, but trying to be what what bar? Cool. It's called uh, Tobacco Road. It used to be called Port Forty One. Mm. It's technically within Port Authority. Underneath, like the bridge, yeah, but you can't get there through Port Authority, you have to enter through the side of the building. It's right around here, yeah. And there used to be a sign on the wall saying that there was no sleeping allowed at or under the tables, which gave you like a sense of the tenor of the place, right? Right, that that had to be clarified. When was that? That was around the time Toy Story 3 came out because I remember we spent a large chunk of that conversation talking about Toy Story 3. Yeah, it's probably 2010. 2010. So you yeah, guys right. have known each other for a while, not longer than I've yeah. known Griffin. Uh, we saw, yes, we saw the change up together. We saw the change up together. Oh, and yeah. we switched phones. We sw- I completely but forgot you didn't switch we did bodies. That. Well, what we no, pretended. My God. The bit was we went to see the change up together <laughs> and we switched phones. So we live tweeted the change up from each other's I Twitter accounts. I completely forgot that we did that. So I was like Griffin oh, stuck on God. Bobby Finger's Twitter account. And I just tweeted about tits the whole time. I forgot about the change up too. Yeah, we saw the <laughs> shit out of it. You forgot about the change up. I and forgot then about our change up. up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, have we said his name? No, he's Bobby what Finger. Gr- <laughs> he's the co-host of the Who Weekly podcast. He is, and he writes for Jezebel. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, he's a great. That's me. Person. He's a great person <laughs> who exists in the world. Uh, I I I will say that, and I I don't know if I say this to your face because I don't like to say things that make people uncomfortable. Uh, you're one of the people I find funniest in the world. So, 
That's, That's okay. really nice. Truly, you make me laugh harder than uh, uh, most people who self-identify as exclusively <laughs> as, as comedians. comedians. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I share my favorite? It's a very random little little memory. I think it might have been the first time I hung out with Bobby Finger, mm. which is when you came to trivia one time. Mm. And we were going, We the three of us were on my computer. I know what you're going to say. I we still were, think about this I think about it all the yeah. time. Wait, am I, we, I forgot this too. No, what no. Was it's, you're it's, dropping it's a very minor, it's a very minor thing. <laughs> We were going through the Academy Awards on Wikipedia, and yeah. every year there was, you know, at the Wikipedia entry has the poster, you know, yeah. and we were just looking at all the posters. The official poster for that year's yeah, ceremony. right. Oh, yeah. And and the, the um, I forget which one, was it the 14 maybe, the 2014 ones? The ones been. hosted yeah. by, the late, the ones that were most recently hosted by Ellen DeGeneres. Right. And we and it had it hadn't happened yet, and the poster hadn't been released. I don't know where yet. this is going. I, I have no idea. <laughs> poster hadn't been released yet. Yeah. And we clicked forward to that year's, like to the upcoming account. And the instead of the poster, there was just a picture of Ellen DeGeneres like smiling at the camera. And this we was all like a month before the burst show. into hysterics yeah. just at this image. And then the poster turned out to just be <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres. Yeah. This is not a funny story for anyone except the three of us. The moment, the moment, I mean, that was her experiential. Legs are, her thing. legs are kind of just like, she's sitting a little, like, yeah, she was cross <laughs> legs sitting and, Indian style. As, she was sitting as, on the floor they, and she had, like, a, an elbow up on a knee. Crisscross applesauce. <laughs> Maybe there was a, an Oscar in front of her, right? Yeah, there yeah. was an it's Oscar like, on the ground. Yeah. But when we were looking before the poster, it was just a straightforward profile picture of Ellen DeGeneres looking right at you. Yeah, and to contextualize this a little bit, the other like uh, posters for the yeah, Oscar like, ceremony are don't have the host in. No, them. they're Art Deco-y no. shots of an Oscar yeah. trophy it's or like, whatever. In what right. way can we reuse this silhouette? Like, how can yeah. we use this silhouette in a different way? And this was like a placeholder because like they'd announced her as the host, but they hadn't made a poster yet. So there was just placeholder Ellen. was some random picture of Ellen, <laughs> and then the actual poster ended up just being for the first time in history just some just picture, a picture of Ellen. Of Ellen. Um, anyway. Durasi might say. Ellen's a bigger prize anyway. So maybe we all would yeah, rather oh, have an Ellen wow. it's very, that, you, than an Oscar. You are such a romantic. You're, you're such a poet. <laughs> yeah. Um, <sighs> uh, th- speaking of poets, I mean, you know, this is a meeting of two great poetic minds today. Oh, that's today right. Because, of course, we have with us our, our resident poet laureate. Uh, there, yeah, he is, there he is, me. coughing in the background. Coughing in the background. He's getting <laughs> oh. over strep throat. Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah, Bobby, you were kind of sick last uh, uh "Quote unquote week," aka yesterday when we sh- when we recorded Speed Ben, you, you called Ben Bobby. Yeah, Ben. Yeah. Ben, yeah. maybe Bobby figured, was sick too. I, I understand. Yeah, his name's not Bobby. Okay, he goes by a couple names: producer Ben, producer Ben, the Ben Deucer. We've already talked about I him like being ben the Deucer. poet laureate. It's oh, a yeah. great. Do you have any favorites? Yeah, uh, yeah. Ben Deucer is my yeah. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, producer Ben, I said that right. Yeah, uh, yeah, said tiebreaker: that. birthday Benny, Mister Positive, uh, the Haas, the Fuck Master. He's not Professor Crispy. The peeper. Um, the peeper, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kylo Ben. Mm-hmm. Uh, Professor Ben Kenobi. Old Ben Kenobi. Oh, whatever. Ben Knight Shyamalan. Ben Knight Shyamalan. There's a bunch of other ones. It's, it's, we got to yeah. go. And it look, goes on and on. Look, it goes I, on and on. All, all I'm asking, you know, because yeah, Ben is you see him. Ben is sick. Yeah. All I'm asking is all our listeners out there, pray for Ben. And, wish, and, and wish him pray up to fennel. God's. They wish him a hello, Fennel. Yeah. A speedy recovery. How yes. you doing, Ben? Um, you know, I'm feeling better today for sure. Uh, I was bummed I didn't get to participate in the Speed Racer talk, but I think it was a great episode, guys. Now, do you wanna do you wanna share some quick thoughts on Speed Racer because you loved it? Do you wanna have your little Ben Speed Racer corner? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I'll say uh, I cried so hard at the end of the movie, like it's an really, emotional ending. Really hit me hard. Um, I yeah, loved the film. I would say. Um, in general, what I'd like in movies moving forward is naming the character around what they do. <laughs> I think that that's really solid. Like, just like Fast Hero. So, like big people. Fast Fast Hero. Fast. <laughs> so, like, Captain America could be called, like, Throwing Shield Man or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah totally. Okay, just yeah. name them what they do. <laughs> okay, so at this, I, I, with this established, I might at certain points within this episode, Ben, ask you to, to rename the characters of Cloud oh, Atlas. I can absolutely do that. There's okay. only a couple of characters in Cloud Atlas anyway. It's not it's, like It's a, pretty contained film. <laughs> Oh, also, did uh, did they tape Christina Ricci's eyes wider open? <laughs> that was the only other thought I had, too, I wanted to put out there. She's very wide-eyed in the That's film. That's crazy. They don't even look real. <laughs> but those are my thoughts on Speed Racer. Uh, Thank you, Ben. Ben is, if you don't know, he is uh, the world's greatest film critic, Bobby. I don't know if you yeah. knew that. I, I didn't know that, but yeah. I'm uh, beginning to understand that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We've submitted our galleys to Doubleday. <laughs> Uh, and make it big, the collected writings of Ben Hosley. 
should be it should be coming in in Q one. Uh, that book is going to be big too. Like, it's, yeah, it's a coffee table. It's book. a coffee it's table. It's going to be a very big. He means big. literally big. It, it will never be released in paperback. Uh, okay, so Cloud Artlers. Yes. Oh, the one thing I want to say, the, the Bobby moment that makes me laugh, and oh, I sure. once again don't know oh if this God. will translate. Yeah, Bobby, we've had so many All great times. Bobby anecdotes. Yeah, but we, we were talking about, I don't remember how we got into this, but you like interrupted the conversation to say like, man, I, I just can't. I'm so excited for when the, um, the uh, Bass Marigold Hotel uh, 2 trailer drops. I said that a lot around that. Whatever time yeah, you were there, was like, I was very excited. We didn't know at the time it was going to be called the second best <laughs> no, which exotic was your, Marigold Hotel. That was your crusade. That was my right. dream, yeah. yeah. But at the time, you just said, like, can you just imagine the trailer? Like, they show all the actors. They show us that, like, Dickie Gear is on board. And then the title comes up, and it says, the best exotic Marigold Hotel. And then very slowly, a two-fight <laughs> And the way you were so sincere, the way you described the I two love those fading movies. in. Yeah. I love them. But it was the specific of the two fading in, that it wasn't there from the get-go, that the title is the title you know, and then the shock of a two. And we could all picture it, couldn't we? We could all picture it. We, we thought it was a lovely image, didn't it was, we? <laughs> we thought it was a <laughs> lovely did. image. It was very uh, it was successful theater of the mind. We all saw what you were seeing. Great. Um you uh we, we you are a listener of the show mm-hmm. and you're you're a pal of both of ours. And I want to have you on the show for a long time. Yes, and you wanted to be on this episode, Bobby. I did. I yeah. was <laughs> maybe, maybe it's because I mean I feel like I didn't realize that as many people liked Cloud Atlas as as they, as they do. Mm-hmm. So when I requested Cloud Atlas, I kind of expected there to be competition, and I expected Griffin to say like mm, someone already took it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Little did I know, no one even offered to o- take Cloud open Atlas. Field. <laughs> yeah. And so I was very shocked, and then I realized, wait, did I pick the no. kind of loser of the bunch? No, but I still no, love no, it. Absolutely I not. still love no, it. Absolutely not. Uh, we, I think we all love it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, it was the first. It was like the first thing that came to mind whenever when, when, uh, the Wachowskis. When were the word Wachowskis. Released. Yeah. 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 Um, this movie was released in 2012. Yeah, mm-hmm. in uh, uh, October 2012, mm-hmm. late October. Uh, Oscar it, season. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, I believe it came out the exact weekend that uh, Hurricane Sandy hit. Or can I read? It, is that, it that might out, be. It came out the weekend of sounds like Sandy, a, yeah. a big New York storm. Because I remember wanting to go see it on Saturday afternoon and having to wait. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just moved so into sorry. an apartment, which I moved into that apartment the Friday before the storm hit. <laughs> so I, I remember specifically because mm-hmm. the box office opening weekend was terrible, and the movie sort of right. never recovered. But it was like there, you know, the whole East Coast was like locked indoors. For this storm. The last yeah. thing on anyone's mind was Cloud Atlas. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was a hundred million dollar independent film. A hundred and twenty eight point five million dollar budget. Uh, nuts. Pretty nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Raised independently, mostly through like German studios. Yeah. Uh, and they'd done Speed Racer in Germany, and Tom Spiker mm-hmm. is German, so I guess you know they got they got their claws in there in that country. Um, and you know, there, there was a sort of like a incredible six minute trailer for this movie that so a great cool. trailer. online. Set to a uh, beautiful trailer. Overture by M83 or one of the yeah. M83. Outro. Oh, it's outro. It's yeah. the, it's not and, the. And the, the beginning of the trailer is set to the music from the score. Right. 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 And then it switches and to, then it switches yeah. to yeah. your outro. Which um, out, outro always is effective in anything. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the MPAA has like regulations that trailers can't be over three minutes long. Oh, really? And so they were just sort of like... It was th- online only. Mm-hmm. I never saw yeah. a trailer mm-hmm. in a theater. Oh, no, no, yeah. no, no. And that trailer had... I mean, I think this is now harder to find, but that trailer had a video introduction by Lana Wachowski, uh, then Larry Wachowski, now Lily Wachowski, and Tom Tviker. And they were sort of like contextualizing the movie and presenting it mm-hmm. to you. Because it was sort of like, mm-hmm. you know, we can't release this longer mm-hmm. one in theaters, but we think the movie's so expansive, it's hard to contain in a three-minute trailer, so we want to give you a better sense of what it is. But they also went into in that introduction explaining how hard it was to get the money to make the movie. Yeah, like they were sort of saying like we had it for years, and then this person dropped out, and then right before this, and Warner Brothers was only going to put up this much, and then right before they decide they want to pull out. I, th- I didn't see that. Uh, it was interesting. I can't find the introduction anymore. Mm-hmm. But it was also one of the first times that like Lana was speaking very publicly as Lana, mm-hmm. uh, and they also weren't ever speaking like when. They they were known for not speaking. They period. Right. They don't really do publicity at all. Right. Yeah. And she was sort of taking the reins and like, kind of hosting this intro because they optioned the book like right after it came right. out, didn't they? The Wachowskis yeah. optioned um, the book, which was 04? It came mm. out in 04. Yeah. And then I think Tviker. How do you say his name? Tviker. I think it's Tviker. Uh, yeah. 
he like wanted to, he like came to them and was like, I want to make this, you know, I know you optioned it and they worked on it. Like they collaborated for years on yeah. it together. The three of them. I, what I didn't understand, I was reading the Wikipedia for it earlier this morning. Um, there's a really long paragraph on that page about Tom Hanks being involved. Mm-hmm. And there's, they kind of, they, it seems like they left part of the narrative out of that paragraph. Yeah. Cause it's like, I know what you're he's talking, talking about. about like, well, I, I want to do it or something. Yeah. And then it's like, and then it happened. But it's like, <laughs> It's yeah. not just because Tom Hanks said yes. Like, where did this money come from? The, yeah. The, it does seem weird. It seemed, you know, they they raised money in, like, bits of pieces. They got, like, 20 million euros from the German government. They got blah, blah, you know. So I guess they were putting money together. I think, and we, yeah. No, maybe it was saying? going to fall. Up, maybe, like, they weren't going to get all the way there. Yeah. And they said that to Tom Hanks, yeah. like, and this is Wikipedia, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, they said that to Han- Tom Hanks, and he was like, no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah, like, and then I'm the Tom ne- Hanks. The next sentence is, there's, like, a sentence that ends the paragraph, but then it's like, and then we were all in Berlin. Yes, and then- yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. I think it was one of those situations where, like, they were 100% yes, fine. So everyone flew to Berlin to begin <laughs> the film. That yeah. is the, yes. <laughs> I think it was like a situation, (laughs) if I remember the intro correctly, they were like 100% financed, and then like 40% dropped out. Oh, Uh okay. Uh But they had like 60%, and they they were were already like setting it up. Right. So at that point, you like have people being like, we're ready to make this movie. Like, you're not going to put your money and have it sitting there for a while. Mm -hmm. We can make this in a month. I think Hank's probably like, you know, pressed the flesh a lot and did whatever. I think Warner Brothers put in a little bit. It might have been under the guise of like, this is the how much we're paying to be able to distribute it mm-hmm. rather than like, you know, actually investing in the film. Did either of you know about this production even happening? Cause I didn't even know this was in the works until the trailer came out. That I, five I minute long honestly thing. can't remember when I found out about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, no, yeah. I don't, did you go ahead? I, I remember reading an interview with Susan Sarandon a, a month or two before the trailer came out and her being like, yeah, I just finished this other film with the Wachowskis and we all play different races and genders. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Quite a lead, really. Yeah, and I like hadn't heard about the book or read the book because I'm an idiot. Um, I had read the I read the book when it came out. I liked hmm. David Mitchell. I read Number Nine Dream, his previous book, oh. which was nominated. I didn't read the book, which was nominated for the Booker Prize. Congratulations, when I was in David. high school or whatever. And then I read this book. I, mean, I haven't read anything since. He's written a lot of books, mm-hmm. yeah. old Mitchy. Uh, but I like this book, and that's the story. Of David reading Cloud Atlas. Yeah. In 2005. I, I, I read that interview and then was like, I don't know what this but, fucking I mean, movie it's is. It's because it wasn't a Hollywood thing, right? That's maybe yeah. why it wasn't okay. so like deadline hyped, you know, every week. I don't know. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was also this thing where like a bunch of people, like important political figures in interviews were like, yeah, I shot this thing with the Wachowskis. And they wanted to make a movie that was like a sort of half documentary, half drama, but it was like a documentary from the future about the military it was like a lesbian military story and ariana huffington was in it and like a bunch of people like that i swear to god excuse me i now need to go down a google rabbit hole but there was a photo that leaked out that was ariana huffington in front of a green screen with in future clothes in future i swear to god this is real with lana and lily wachowski then larry and it was andy is now is now um it, 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 yes, you're right. Larry yes, I'm sorry. I fucked it up. Yes, Jenny. yes, yes. I fucked it up. Y- you're right. This is a real thing. Yeah. And they She's were shooting this clothes? weird movie, and it was like they were paying out of pocket. This was years before Cloud Atlas, though. But yeah. but my point is that was a thing that was sort of talked about, and it was like, oh, they're shooting this these pieces. This would be the wraparound. They're trying to get the money to do the narrative. Like, I guess it was going to be sort of like District 9, where it's like you have like fake documentary talking mm-hmm. heads, and then you sort of have the dramatic narrative. Okay. So they were like shooting the interview stuff. We're trying to get the money to do the rest of it. And we're paying for that stuff out of pocket. So when I heard the Sarandon like, oh, we're all playing different like races and genders. I was, I was like, maybe this is another thing like that. <laughs> yeah. There's future a, wig. You left out the yeah. future wig. Uh, just to let you know, just to really briefly. Please. And then we really need to talk about this movie. Jesse Ventura also shot. Thank you. Uh, Governor yep. Jesse Ventura. Oh. Governor Jesse the body Ventura. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, said. They brought me and they brought Ariana Huffington in after me. Ariana was there and they had her looking like Cleopatra. Do you remember what John Travolta looked like in that horrible film Battlefield Earth? They put multicolored dreadlocks on me all the way to here. They gave me this crazy beard. Looked like Travolta, right? And I put a third eye in the middle of my forehead. <laughs> I'm reading this cold. And this is like from 10 years ago, right? I mean, yeah. when's the story from? It's from like seven? No, oh, 09. Okay. Uh, and because, you know, this is 100 years in the future, and they wanted me to talk about the war in Iraq and how I felt with it. So I got to vent, looking like a maniac. Right. They, now, if Jesse 
the body Ventura thought he looked like a maniac. He really looked weird. <laughs> like, and this movie is—is is this like scrapped or is I, it? Just I don't on know. Hold? They Maybe never they got just... the money for the rest of the yeah, thing. Apparently, it was like—I mean, it was like a small, like okay. queer military drama, like love story. So I think it was very hard to get financing. Okay. But when they talked about Cloud Atlas, I was like, this might be part of that. This might be like some other project that they're shooting things for that's never going to get seen. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't. No, when the trailer dropped, I was like, oh, this is Let's an actual about movie Atlas. that they made and is going to be viewable? Yes. Yeah. Film Cloud Atlas. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, We're going to talk about it now. Okay. Wh- so when did you guys see this movie? I just saw it. You just saw it for the first time? Yeah. Oh, oh I, I had never that. seen it. Oh, I had no oh. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. I saw it maybe, uh, I remember wanting to see it uh, right at, as it came out, but I guess that's why the I storm. didn't. Storm, yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw it maybe the third or fourth week. I saw it at the uh, Regal Union Square AMC, uh, an, a Saturday matinee. I want to say. Oh well, good choice. And Bobby. I wasn't really, and I wasn't really expecting to Didn't love it. Long. I yeah. thought I would like it. Yeah. But I remember like leaving and then like exiting into the light. Yeah. And just being so <laughs> satisfied. I was just so satisfied by yeah. this movie, uh, and very surprised because I I wasn't familiar with the book. I mean, mm-hmm. I knew it's 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 a favorite book of a few friends of mine who have right. tried to tell me to read it, but I haven't read it. Right. Uh, but I wasn't expecting to be like overwhelmed by it mm-hmm. and like like manipulated, but like in a, in a very pleasurable way. I'm trying to remember why I didn't see this movie, and it might have been because of like Hurricane Sandy or something. Like, they might have been literally something that obvious that like mm-hmm. I missed it if the first couple of weeks, and then it you know well, it disappeared. Like I mean, dudes like us who are like movie omnivores, when mm-hmm. you get into October and there's going to be like a, a couple lot of big movies on, coming out every week. Blah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. You know? I was like yeah. moving. We yeah, both moved. I moved. That's so yeah. weird. But it's something oh, where like. so weird. Yeah. But like that weekend you don't go see anything because of the storm. So then the following weekend you're backlogged. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean the other problem is like not, I have no problem with a three hour movie. Yeah. But when it's a three hour movie. You can't just be like, I'm going to like pop over right. to the IFC the center and catch that. You plan like, your day around. Yeah, yeah. you're like, okay, oh, that's yeah. like, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for some reason, I had never seen this movie. So I've told you this. I had one of the absolute worst movie-going experiences of my life seeing, seeing this, this movie. movie. Okay. Yes. I think I've told you this. I told Ben this. Go ahead. Uh, where, I, where was it? Uh, I went to the AMC Lincoln Square. Perfectly fine. I believe it's a 13. Lincoln Square It's a 13. 13. It's the Lincoln Square 13. Yes. Uh, 68th and Broadway. But all the theaters are called like, the like, Aztec. It's yeah. got like 13 elevators too in my escalators. Too, <laughs> right. Right? All those escalators. This is what oh I'm saying. God. Funniest guy in the biz right here. <laughs> Uh, roasted. <laughs> yeah, roasted. Yeah, uh, okay. You got Just fingered. shitting on Lincoln Square. <laughs> fingered. <laughs> Um, I th- I think it was uh, the Egyptian. I think we maybe went- sure, sure. The sure. So it wasn't not. in the IMAX. It was in the, it was in one of the uh, regulars. Our friend Common. Uh, I went to go see it with him. I, for a second, I thought you just said our friend Common. Meaning that's the what rapper. I thought you yeah. said yes. too. Uh, my my Bulgarian friend Common Volkovsky. Yes, yeah, so former name is, trivia. Yeah, his name is spelled K A M E N. Anytime I reference him, people think I'm friends with the rapper Common. <laughs> yes, right. I just um, did. Hell yeah. on Wheels star <laughs> Common, which is sort of like you know, dress for the job you want. Be friends with the person you want to be friends with. If I'm friends with someone named Common, maybe someday I'll be friends with Common. But you went to see it with Common, mm-hmm. uh, and we were sitting sold out theater, right? Oh wow. Um, is, we're, was are we talking opening week? Opening weekend? I'm guessing maybe it was that Monday or Tuesday. Maybe Sold that Sunday theater. after the storm. It was anyway, surprising, anyway. right? Yeah. So we're sitting on the aisle, but there's one seat. Like, we're not all the way on the aisle, right? Okay. We go in towards the middle, so there's one seat at the end of the aisle next to the two of us. And a woman, a, a kind-looking woman comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder, and says, uh, hey, is this seat open? And I went, yeah. And she went, okay, great, thank you, and walks away. Hmm. Uh-oh. Has the movie? Is it, are the previews happening now, or or, or what? Uh, I think maybe the previews had just started. Okay. Okay. And then she comes back, leading a man in his maybe early to mid twenties, plops him down in the chair, and this is her adult, severely developmentally disabled Uh-oh. son. Oh no! And then she goes and bones out, sits oh, somewhere else shit. in the theater. Oh my god! And this is not an uh, a short or uh, easy and accessible film. No, and look, uh, uh, you know, yeah, this I, is tricky territory. Yeah, this I, is I very did, tricky. I did not know this territory yeah, at all. I, 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 you know, I, I cannot uh, uh, diagnose this man. I don't know what sure. exactly his struggles mm. were. I do know my struggle was. <laughs> uh, he sat there the entire time. And any time there was a woman on screen, he'd go, oh, my God, so beautiful, so beautiful. Oh, my God, so beautiful, so beautiful. Even, what, all right. 
Anytime. What about when Hugo Weaving played a lady in the old folks' home? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Oh, no. I see. I see. All right. Oh. So and a lot then, of talking. Anytime Tom Hanks was on screen. He verbalized with all of his emotions. A beautiful woman. He goes, Zachary, kiss her. Zachary, kiss her. Kiss her. Zachary. Oh, no. Oh, no. So beautiful. Zachary. So just the, like a Three running hours. commentary. For- <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so my takeaway was, I, I, I think I liked that movie. <laughs> oh my God. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't love it, and I definitely didn't dislike it, but I was like, I don't know. And it's like, you're fucking, all these, like, plot lines are interweaving, and a lot of the connections are subtle. Yeah, it's right. They're Hugo yeah. weaving. They're Hugo. <laughs> Funny I'll finger. leave. I'll leave. I'm sorry. Ben, can you add in, like, a guitar riff anytime we get fingered? Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. a Seinfeld uh, so a bass bad. slap? Finger. <laughs> Uh, oh boy! Um, so miserable. we all had different theatrical experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I watched but Bobby's. It. Mine was, was great. Very pleasant. Yeah, yeah mine yeah. was great. You, great do you know? Time. Do you remember where you saw it, Bobby? Yeah, Union, Union Square. Square. Oh, Fourteen. I, I, I yeah. missed. I'm, I'm I can sorry. even. And it was. It was the. It was the. The one. Uh, up upstairs okay. with the with the balcony, oh, balcony. but I was nice. in the I was in the bottom part. Sure, I was in the sure. orchestra. That's the way to do it. Yeah. But, but the Union Square. One reason I don't go there a lot is sometimes you'll get you know stuffed into one of the little theaters. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But if you're yeah. in the big theater, very nice. Great. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I hate those little theaters. Yeah, they suck, yeah. especially if it's like you're going to see your whatever your Civil War, your big movies, you want and they're showing them on eight screens, <laughs> and like yeah. you don't know, you don't know. That happened with us seeing Force Awakens. Like yeah. we at the MC twenty five, we got put in one of them shoe boxes. Yeah. Opening yeah. night. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's okay though. Uh Ben, what do you think about little theaters? Uh well, uh I mean it's intimate, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like I want to be I want to be in a big room. This is a real conflict because you like big rooms, but you also like fucking. That's true. So the intimacy. <laughs> He's the fuck master. I am right, the fuck right. master. Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas. <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah, I watched it again for the first time since the I, uh, theatrical viewing two yeah. nights ago. Yep. And uh, I think this movie's great. So good. Great. Yeah. It's great. Holy I watched cow. it this morning. Yeah. Watching it in the comfort of my own home without anyone else talking. Yeah. Like a, a big upgrade. This movie mm-hmm. went up like three points, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It was like maybe like a like a like a gentleman six point five, and now it's maybe like like a nine, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's really phenomenal. Um, so let's talk about the plot of this one because it's very straightforward. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. Uh, Bobby, go right. Uh, what's the plot of the movie? So, uh, <laughs> which 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 one should I start with? Should we just do it? Take turns with the plots. Well, I can start ask, when it's all yeah, one yeah, big let's story. All hand, <laughs> let's all hand off. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, you've yeah. got so you've got several. Actors uh, mm-hmm. playing several roles that span several An ensemble. centuries. There's like a stock. An company. ensemble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've got, and in every story, there is, uh, you know, a hero, mm-hmm. a There's villain. There's a lead, and right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is uh, a love interest. There is. Uh, what am I trying? What else is there in every story? Yeah, but there's, uh, there's sh- a struggle. I mean, of course, there's there's a struggle, but then there's um. So let's just talk about the first one. So sure. you've got. The movie, the bookend of the movie, let's start with that. Mm-hmm. You've got Tom Hanks as, uh, you know, three centuries into our present. Um, so three centuries into the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is living on the big island of Hawaii mm-hmm. yeah. um, after some sort of an apocalyptic nuclear event because they talk about rad levels at some point. They do. Mm-hmm. They do. Um, so he's, he's, he's a, a survivor. He's a tattooed man. He's a tattooed man living in a very primitive society on mm-hmm. the big island. Yeah. Uh, a very small society. He... Uh, is feeling he's he's wrecked with guilt because he did not try to save um his like nephew just yeah, some, some, some sort of like relative distant yeah. relatives from an attack uh, uh from uh, Hugh Grant and his cannibal yeah, friends. Yeah, Hugh Grant plays a cannibal in that one. Hugh Grant so, plays well, like shitty people. Yeah, this is the thing. Right, Everyone's right. roles change except for Hugh Grant, except who's Hugh Grant always, always a jerk. Yeah, Watch always out bad. for Hugh Grant. And yeah. Hugo Weaving's always a jerk too. Both of them. Are, uh, right? Yeah, I guess yeah. that's uh, true. Or like, Hugo Weaving's always some sort of obstacle. He's not. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I only like there's in like like you know he's a kind of anti-Semitic in one, or no, he's not anti. He's, he's racist. Like, yeah, he's racist in one, and then yeah. he's an assassin in one, and then he's you know a, a stovepipe hat wearing uh, <laughs> physical you know body <laughs> physical of his physicalization own, of mental illness of, of terror. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and, and then he's like, oh, I'm old Georgie. Watch out for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's and then he's a mean nurse. A mean nurse. <laughs> and, uh, it is most of yeah, a real mean he is, nurse. He is a nurse ratchet type, you know, yeah. scary nurse. Type. Can I just interject? Because I think who's this doing is... a Mrs. Doubtfire impersonation? Also, yeah. uh, he's, he's, he's 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 he sounds weird. like Mrs. It's very strange. <laughs> it's really weird. It's I just want to interject because I think this is like really brilliant. But I think I think the final chunk of the financing came from them selling the the rights to Warner Brothers, right? 
uh-huh. for the film, oh, right. the Wachowskis. Yeah, yeah, the distribution rights. And it, if I remember correctly, there was a big New Yorker article, which I suggest people look up and read, about the Wachowskis um, before Cloud Atlas came out, about like where they were in their careers mm-hmm. and how this was a big step forward for them and trying to make a different kind of film. And they said the big selling point we gave to Warner Brothers was, because this film was so expensive, it was so hard for them to get a sense of what it would be, how it would work, what audience it was for. And they said we came up with a very simple through line, which is the movie starts out with Tom Hanks as a bad person. Mm-hmm. And 600 years later, he becomes a good person. Right. Okay. Uh, the official synopsis describes it as um, how one soul is shaped from a killer to a hero and an act of kindness ripples across centuries to inspire a revolution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, I think they designed, like, the Hanks arc so that he becomes, you know, yeah. from people who are aggressively bad to people who are just sort of, like, got a bad attitude. <laughs> You know, yeah. to, to the hero. But wait, point. when is he? Oh, right. Okay. He's, he's yeah. a straight he's the, up villain. I forgot in, in he's the, the villain in the, in the first story. Yeah. I completely forgot that it's, that's him. Um, Who tries to kill Jim Sturgis? Yeah. He does. His gold. W- to steal his ring steal his and gold. some other stuff. Um, uh, but let's get back to this future. Um, so, one. so the yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try yeah. to I'll try to do this succinctly. But yeah. uh, so meanwhile, so he lives in this like horrible, like kind of barbaric post apocalyptic society. Yes. But meanwhile, there is a, a there is a sort of uh, uh, Elysium type colony outside of Earth. Um, and occasionally they do tests, and Halle Berry is like one of these people who is, you know, very intelligent. The one yeah. percent, they have all of the cures to diseases and blah blah, but they're still not doing well with radiation. So every time she goes to this island, she should watch out. She wants to get to the top of this volcano mm-hmm. because there's some sort of communications tower right, on they it. Can shoot no a one, signal into space. No one wants to help lead her there because they're afraid of the cannibals with good reason. They um, are cannibals. Yeah. Yes. And so she, after after Tom Hanks saves her life, he convinces her. She convinces him. To, no, he convinces her to. No, he saves the life of the baby. No, I'm getting confused. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'm, it's I'm okay. Weaving. So he, I'm Hugo Weaving. <laughs> um, so she and Tom Hanks make it to the communication towers to get to this, you know, thing for some reason, and mm-hmm. then and there they uncover the truth uh, about soon me. Well, okay, or right, one one, right, right, right. Anyway, right. so the whole point is they have to get from here through it's the cannibals. It's a very simple to the top quest. Of the thing. You gotta get to the That's top it. of the mountain and get to the mountain. Hugo Weaving is a green goblin. <laughs> Yeah, who is just with in Tom hat. Hanks' yeah. head with he's, the top hat. He's dressed Called like Fagin. Old Georgie. Old Georgie. Old Georgie. Yes. And I think he's a, you know, a particularly terrifying character. I think I he's agree. a very scary Quite, fun. quite strange. Yeah. Especially because <laughs> in this already incongruous environment, he is a new element. Yeah. So like an yeah. even more incongruous mm-hmm. element. Yeah. But this is the book and it begins the movie. And it ends. We and it ends the movie. Okay. Uh, uh, but the movie just, begins with yeah. Tom Hanks in Zachary Tom Hanks giving some sort of monologue, Looking which you find like out is Jeff just, Bridges being run over by a truck, which yeah. you find out then he's just telling his grandchildren and great great grandchildren right. the story yeah. of you know. Because after all, isn't this a movie about stories? It's, it's about it's about humanity, it's about life, yeah, and it's about and sharing right. our connections. connection through stories, and it yeah. has this handshake structure where like you know things recur through these six stories. Yeah. It's, I, so I fired this movie up. My girlfriend watched 40 minutes of it and was just like, I, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's, especially at the beginning, it's yeah. daunting what it's yeah. doing. Because yeah. the book, as you guys might know, um, it tells one story and then it moves to the next story and then the next and then mm-hmm. the next and the next and then meets in the middle with the Big Island story, the future, future, future yeah. apocalypse. Mm-hmm. And then it goes backwards. It, it's like know, a parallelogram, it's right? Like, it's, it's like nesting dolls. It's yeah. like then it goes back to the fifth story, back yeah. to the fourth, and it ends again with okay. the first. Now, this movie, they abandoned that and have them all woven together, mm-hmm. which is the right decision. It works yeah. well, yeah. Yes. Like the first 40 minutes are throwing everything in your yeah. face. And it's, like, it's hard because yeah. it's supposed to be kind of dancing, this and movie. The, yeah. you know, it's, like, yeah. it's not an omnibus film because it is interwoven constantly. And the first 40 yeah. minutes kind of... It suggests that the movie is more complicated than it is. Yeah, right. like you said, the the it's a pretty straightforward it's narrative. True. Like, and, and I Each but like story trying to is talk about it. Is, yeah. Right. Yeah. You you get lost, but then it it really there's not much to it. And no, you know, no, for, no, a, th- for a three yeah. hour movie, it moves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. There are a couple storylines that are a little, I would say, a little more plotting, and like some that are really exciting. You know, yeah. like it, 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 the, it, the pacing isn't like always exact. Yeah. But uh, mm-hmm. it's great. And it's gorgeous. It is. It's we, gorgeous. It is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. We did forget to mention in the future story, everyone talks like Muttley from Wacky Waves. Yeah. And a, then Holly uh, Berry, like, is, true, true, Holly yeah. Blair, Berry is fluent in their dialect. Yeah. And like every time she switches to it, it's like, okay, that's yeah, it's funny. It's a little, <laughs> it, it's just condescending. Right. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's sort of like, when, it's like, like when Hillary Hollywood. Clinton goes to like, you know, a church in Iowa yeah. and like has a different, you know. She's like, listen, folks. Talks like she's from the Midwest. Y'all got to understand. But um, I, I think one thing my girlfriend uh, Joanna mm-hmm. uh, 
who we're about to see. Oh, shout Civil out to Joanna. With, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to go. Um, we're going to see the shit out of Civil War with Joanna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing that she reacted to when, I, when she watched the openings of this movie is, why are white people playing Asians in this movie? Yeah. And questions like that. Yeah. Or like Halle Berry shows up in uh, the 1930s plot line looking like... Looking like Madonna, yeah. Mm-hmm. Looking like a, a weird white face Madonna, a Jew weird. <laughs> yeah, playing yeah. a playing a Jew. Yeah. And I said to her, "That's Halle Berry," and she said, "No, it isn't." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I was a fair reaction. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the other thing. So the, the big notion, and you didn't film, have a response. <laughs> yeah. like, I was like, "Well, I know what you're saying," <laughs> because this this film is about the sort of interconnectedness of the human spirit mm-hmm. yes. and certain energies and certain dynamics. And this is a over recurring over theme in the Wachowskis' work: is right. that you are so. not who you look like, and your you know your identity is beyond your you know your sort of shape or your skin or your like you know. And I think there's an even simpler version of it that that comes very clear in this film, you know. And looking back through the previous films, it goes into this. But the idea that like we're all the same. Yeah, right, sure. And that's, I think, what I like about the the movie. It's it's not about reincarnation, and there's never anything yeah. where it's like the soul has continued. It's just talking about we are all we're doing the same things over and over because like yeah. humans are humans. I mean, like, yeah. question for you guys, sure. because obviously the gambit they pull is that they cast like you know they have a cast of about twelve, mm-hmm. and they have them all play different parts in these different stories. Like, yeah. if this movie was just literally like a giant ensemble piece where every story had different actors in it, wouldn't work as well. No, right? absolutely not. No. Yeah. Absolutely, not. that was. I mean, that was the master show because their their whole thing. I mean, I feel like there are two points you start to realize uh, arc over all their films are uh, every single person is important. You know, they detest anyone valuing themselves more highly over anyone else, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, structures and societies that do that. You know, I mean, slavery is like a big thing that comes up in all their movies. In this one, it's literal. Yeah. But both Matrix and Jupiter Ascending have this thing where people are harvesting human bodies for energy. Right. right. You know, like that's a big thing. And then Speed Racer has this whole like. The company we are all is commoditizing to capitalism. Yeah, right, people turning them into products. Speed Racer is a crazy haven't movie. Haven't seen Bobby. Speed Racer. Have not seen it. Oh, it's great. <laughs> uh, check it out. Uh, the last line of Bound, which I forgot to mention when we did our Bound episode, mm-hmm. is like uh, one of my favorite last lines of film ever. Where they ca- in Bound, they keep where on they talking say, about that. Sure was a crazy lesbian <laughs> heist <laughs> drama. They say, we, they say we sure got bound up in some drama. <laughs> Um, no, but like Bound is like, you know, they it, it, a lot of the film is about how they're different. They're in mm-hmm. love, but they're fundamentally different people. And the last line is Gina Gershon says, you know, it's the what's the difference between you and me? And Jeffrey Tully goes, what? And she goes, nothing. Mm-hmm. And it's like they become one person. Like mm-hmm. we're all the same fucking person when you get past the superficial stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And so this movie gets at that idea now. I mean, now, I want to say, like, yeah. I, like we've talked about this with the Matrix sequels. We talked about it with Speed Racer. Yeah. The Wachowskis often are doing something that maybe the world is not ready for them to do. Agreed. Usually it's something in the technological mm-hmm. side, right? They're shooting a movie with, like, kind of effects that our body, like, are, yes. we're just, it's just, not, cinema has not really yeah. reached it yet. And they're reaching. Here, I would say that Gambit is more the uh, multicultural uh, casting idea. The, uh, you know, the having yeah. people play all races and sizes and shapes. But and... people don't play all races, though. That's no. one thing. There's yes. never black face. There is. Well, which is very smart. There's, because... there's a lot of white face. There's yeah. a lot of yellow face. Yeah, there is. There's and never black face. They, they, they wisely avoid that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just think but it's then, too but then, loaded. But like, then you can't the, do it. Yeah. there was right, that associate, like the people, then the, there was like the Chinese American Association sure. or whatever was very upset that because of the double standard. It's like, standard. well, you do yellow face and you do white face, but why didn't you black face? And it's like, there's no good, there's, there's, there's no good an explanation that, for There's this. not an answer. That's right. Because look, if they, if they, it's going to be problematic no matter what they do it, but no matter yeah. what, they do, what um, they do. If they had done blackface in this film, it wouldn't have been to perpetuate stereotypes. It would have just been means to an end because that's the notion of the film. Right. But the fact of the reality is, for good reason, yeah. if Don't you put someone blackface, in blackface, ever. everyone gets upset. Yeah, like, Jim, it's, it's, of course. If Jim Broadbent had played the slave in the first story or whatever, that wouldn't have worked. Right. But it's just like, but that's that's the that's the ultimate conclusion you reach, where it's like, you know, at least they didn't do blackface. <laughs> yeah, where it's almost that you can forgive everything else, where it's like, okay, they made Jim Sturgis look like a Korean man, and, and they James made Darcy and <laughs> yeah. uh, Keith David too. Yes. Yeah, they did it yeah. to Keith David, yeah, a Korean which I, woman, I believe. He uh, played. Does, and then, I can't remember. And then it's like, but at least there's no blackface. So well, but this is the thing. Like you say, there's no right answer to this, mm-hmm. and there's no like, well, oh, I think they threaded the needle. They tried something, and. Here it is. This is what I'd like to say about it, too. I, I think the the uh, makeup on it's it's in the the second story, if we're going chronologically from the future to the past. Right. Mm-hmm. The second story is the neo soul story. Yes. 
which oh, is you're going from the future to the past, okay. right? Because mm-hmm. we went yeah, with the right. yeah, yeah. I, I consider right. that the fifth story, but yes. Right. Uh, so that's the one that has the most race swapping. Yes. Well, right, because it's set in Korea. Right, and we have two Asian actors in the cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And everyone uh, Duna, else is... Duna Bay and yes. uh, who's the other Asian actor? Her name is... It's, oh, uh, uh, Zhu Sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, both of them are fantastic. He plays Yuna 939. Yeah, and, and both of them play other people in the other stories. Yes. Um, but every other character in this film, including Hugh Grant, Hugh within Grant. that story, mm-hmm. has to be given makeup to look right. more Asian. Yeah. Now, that's the biggest transformation. The look is very strange, it's, and it's jarring. And yes. even just from the trailer, like, that popped more than the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and, maybe could have done better with the makeup. Yeah. Uh, and when you're watching... It works in the assault to some extent because it's the future already, so you're like, are these aliens? Like, what is right. this really strange? Thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I would say the Hugh Grant character that he plays, who is basically just like a fat, sexist uh, slob... Yeah. With, rapist. Yeah, rapist with yeah. like a top knot or a something. A robot rapist. Uh-huh. Robot. Uh, yeah. well, clones. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 Um, He's he's tougher to get around. Yeah. You know, because like James Darcy and Jim Sturgis are playing these sort of like very like... Uh, like conservatively dressed kind of like sort of almost like cypher type characters mm-hmm. like you're not quite sure what to make of them not mm-hmm. cypher from the matrix not cypher from the matrix or the character. new mutants yeah. yeah 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 um too bad joey pants is in this and not movie. cypher rage we should say also yeah. but i think the, the the forgivable the reason that that it's more forgivable because i think there will always be something wrong with that sort of race swapping is is again the 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 narrative like the, sure. the yeah. themes of the movie right. like it, it's it's a it's about how we all we all transcend these things. Right. Well, and this is so the, when you yes. have that to back up your 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 reasoning, yeah. like you get like a bit of a, you get like a piece of a pass. Th- this you know? is the bigger point I want to get at, which is that the Neo Soul one jumps out not just because the makeup's the strangest, mm-hmm. but it's because the one that leads with that earliest, right? Mm-hmm. Because your right. first into that story is James Darcy in that makeup talking to Duna Bay, mm-hmm. who has a normal human face, right. who yeah. is a Korean, <laughs> right? Yes. And he's doing an accent, yes, yeah. yeah. But the other sort of race swappings come in later in the film. So, like, I'd say Halle Berry as a white woman comes in maybe 40 minutes. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, a yeah. uh, uh, Duna Bay la- right. later plays a Mexican woman, and that's, like, right. two hours into the movie. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, like, all that stuff sort of becomes integrated later, and the main characters are being introduced to are, like, people playing their own race. And Duna Bay's character as that Mexican woman is, in the credits, Mexican woman. Yes. Right, yes. yes. Yeah. So right. it's like, she's just a that's Mexican That's what woman. she is, yeah. right? But I think... If you're watching the film from the get-go, it's like, okay, so why is everyone playing themselves except the Asian cast is, like, Mm -hmm. all fucking people with weird, like, foreheads, right? Right. It's basically the Asian makeup is, like, a forehead that sort of, like, makes the brow look completely different. Yeah, it, like, lowers their eyelids. It's odd. It's It's really – it's it's, it's, it's hard – it's hard to look at. A little it bit. Actually, it really yeah, is. Right. It just looks very yeah. unnatural. But, but I think as the film goes on, it sort of justifies that because then it like starts spreading the well. Mm-hmm. And there's this big point that was made by Halle Berry in an interview, right? Mm-hmm. And like better to have Halle Berry herself explain this, what, what she appreciates about this approach, because I think it summed up perfectly. Mm-hmm. Is she was like she was shooting the, the sex myth segment mm-hmm. where she plays six this, this six myth. Sorry. She said sex myth. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, I'd like to sex her Smith. I'd like to sex Ben Wishaw Smith. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd, he's a handsome boy. I'd like to sex but... Agent Smith. Um, mm. the, you know, he's a handsome guy. Um, the, uh, the, the thing she said is I was shooting that segment and I was in this, you know, white makeup and mm-hmm. everything. And mm-hmm. I realized. This was, this was the only. Jocasta? That's her name. New? C- please carry on. <laughs> I realized <laughs> that uh, this was the only film. By by doing this, by having this approach to it, this was the only way that I could be in a film set in this time period and not play a slave. Right. Oh. Because it's set in the 30s. You know, so well, for like as much as you're having like Jim Sturgis play a Korean man, yeah. you're also letting Halle Berry play roles that she could never play. Right. If I could counter, and I love this yeah. movie. Yeah, the only I just counter think that's an interesting point. Almost mm-hmm. everyone who is in white makeup in this movie is playing a pretty minor role in the in their respective Agreed. stories. Agreed. Because the cast is still majority white. So your main mm-hmm. cast, just to shout them out, yeah. is you got Jim Sturgis, who's this this the star, ostensibly, of the 1840s plot uh, yeah. set on mostly on a boat. He's on a boat trying to get to his wife or fiance. His, his wife. No, wife. fiance, fiance. Who is fiance. played by Duna yeah. Bay. <laughs> right, yes. right. Uh, who's playing a white woman. Who's but playing, we're only really seen right at the end, but yes. Is, is playing like a British r- red-haired, red-haired freckled aristocrat. Face. Duna yes. Bay as that woman reminded me of Juno Temple. Did you know? Did you yeah, pick no, up on that? that I was mean, like, this is a very, because it's just like. Talking to a co-worker at Juno oh, Temple's right. right here. Yeah. Uh, I referenced Juno Temple in the last episode too. Did you? Yeah, because uh, Julian Temple almost directed Speed Racer. 
her that's, father. Mm, that's right. Uh, you know what's another thing I want to throw out just very quickly? Throw it out. Uh, you know how uh, Neil Blomkamp is threatening to make this uh, Alien sequel? Don't oh, do yeah. it, Neil. Uh, I, I saw Aliens uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. I mean, by the time this the fucking episode Jim Cameron's like Aliens? Ago. They screened it on Alien Day, which is this new holiday yeah, yeah. they're trying to make happen. And Sigourney Weaver did like a big talk afterwards. And I went with uh, my sister, Rom, who had never mm-hmm. seen the movie before, and our, our buddy, Rachel Lang, friend of the podcast. Great movie. Rachel loves Aliens, um, I know. And I'd never seen Aliens on a big screen before. Mm-hmm. What's your point? Uh, if they're doing this fucking alien sequel, Juno Temple has to play Newt. Because the little girl who she plays would, Newt she would be a good Newt. looks yeah. identical to Juno Temple, oh. and that woman has never acted ever again, so they're not going to get her to Quick play. Quick sidebar, don't make that movie. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Neil Blomkamp is the most overrated director alive. I agree. Yeah. But if you do do it, do it with <laughs> Juno Temple. No, thank you. Who's a great right. actress. So I'm just I'm shouting out the cast. I'm doing yeah. it. All right. So you, you got Jim Sturgis. You got yes. Ben Whishaw, who is mm-hmm. the uh, star of the 1930s. We're talking lead of each story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Star. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, the 1930s plot about a struggling gay composer trying to make, make his it work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got Halle Berry, who is the star of the 70s plot, which is kind of like a journalist thriller. Mm-hmm. About it's, her a trying... Ray it's a Louisa Ray mystery. It's a Louisa Ray mystery. mystery yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you've got um, Jim Broadbent, who is the star of the current day, 2012, uh, London... Uh, it's called oh, the ghastly. Some, what's it called? Uh, the, yeah, his, something his, situation of of uh, the Timothy Cavendish. Or right. something. Yeah. I can't remember exactly, but it's, uh, it's a bit of a, a farce. It's about yeah. a, it's about an aging literary agent who is locked in an old folks' home against his will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it gets and a plunger, also gets to, a the plunger face. to the face. Uh, which I watching again, I realized that plunger was CG. Did you really? notice that? Really? The, the I think the, the stick the, the, was the, the stick was real. Sure, but the plunger itself was was not. Uh, was Ooh. not real. I'm gonna have to go back and check the that. Plunger out. was not a was not a practical effect. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Jim Broadbent's allergic to human excrement. Maybe they had to I work was, around. Well, that. I think it may have been they couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't hear, hear him. him. Interesting. Very uh, that's, interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right. It was. Just pull up the clip I'm later. Gonna, the, clip it's up. really. I, I rewound it and I was like, that plunger doesn't look real. <laughs> um, then you have Duna Bay, who is the star of the Neo Soul 2144 yeah. as a replicant woman who right. is a waitress mm-hmm. at a Korean, a Neo Korean. And becomes bar. the sort of face of a movement. Uh, mm-hmm. And then yeah. you have Tom Hanks, who is ostensibly the star of the final plot that we talked about already. The great Thomas Hanks. Yes. Mm-hmm. But they are all in, pretty much all of them are in every story. A couple of missing yeah. spots, but you know, like Ben Wishaw plays. Hugh Grant's wife what? in like George one scene. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like there are little like drops like that and then there's Who it's supporting. implied has also fucked Jim yeah. Broadbent. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Now why'd they cut that scene out of the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Broadbent and Hugh Grant in old age make well no, Jim Broadbent's not an old age maker. No, I want to see Broadbent oh. in his real skin mm-hmm. plowing Ben Wishaw as a woman. Yeah. The 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 young Jim Broadbent that they use whenever he's like reminiscing about like uh the oh, when he oh, when he was when fucking he was, young Susan yeah. Sarandon mm-hmm. was like Jim Broadbent yeah. there's no universe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did he ever look like that? Yeah. Jim Broadbent looked like that. Good sir, I know Jim Broadbent <laughs> and you are no Jim Broadbent. Uh and then <laughs> you you have a normal person face. <laughs> we should and then there there don't look like a cartoon mouse. <laughs> then there are all these supporting actors. <laughs> a corpulent cartoon well, mouse. Look, Hugh Bonneville played young Broadbent in Iris. And that basically worked. That's fine. Yeah, that was fine. That's, That's fine. fine. You know, yeah. he's more of a cartoon mouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just shout out to him. Yeah, I would also cast Radigan from The Great Mouse Detective, I think, could play young Jim Rodney. <laughs> he's busy. He, they, uh, that guy's schedule's packed. Come on. <laughs> uh, and then you've got this supporting cast. Hugh Grant, always a villain. Always a villain. Yeah. Uh, Hugo Weaving, always an obstacle of some yep. sort. Susan Sarandon, like, I don't was, know. A, was free that week. Yeah, <laughs> around. <laughs> uh, not really stretching herself, no. except for, no. I mean, she wears a lot of weird makeup. She always plays an aspirational figure, sort of. Uh, well, it, she's but, always, no, uh, she's, she's yeah, sort of a mentor think, in the future yeah. plot. I don't know. In the future plot, she really doesn't serve much of a purpose. No. Uh, Keith David pops up a few times. I'm great sorry. actor, great yeah, I was voice. Say, the great we Keith love David. Keith Let's refer to him by what his full name. The uh, great voice. Keith David. Uh, James Darcy pops up a lot, who's a great British uh, yeah. young. He's not that young anymore, but handsome yeah. Brit. Um, I love him. And David Giassi, or Giassi, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, who is so good in Interstellar and is so mm-hmm. good in this. I didn't fucking realize that yeah. was the same. He plays, he plays Romilly in Interstellar. He does. He plays the only Romilly film character Newman. in history to have my sister's name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His main plot is the first one where he's the slave, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, he, who Jim Sturgis, he's, and then he's, he's got very small roles in He's the one yeah. of the 1% in the future plot. He is, and yeah. he, I think he's Louisa Ray's, like, brother father. or father. Oh, because he's only seen him in a photo. Yeah, and I think there's one other one he appears in. But yeah, but so they're all pop 
chopping up in each other's. They're wearing crazy makeup. Mm-hmm. And the movie kind of starts out, I feel like, with big chunks of each story. And then it kind of starts cutting yeah. faster and faster between them as, okay, let's, as things go on. Let's try to set up another story because we set up the, the first one. The, the okay, Neo Soul yeah. we've done like no. half the work on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, she's like a, a clone. She's an... Yeah. yeah, this is such a cool, visually such a cool thing. Yeah, they all pop out of these little drawers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a clone with like a limited brain almost mm-hmm. or something. Like she's been sort of programmed to not do much. It's a future fast food restaurant right. that, in order to like reduce costs on like uh you know labor. Uh, staff labor, uh, clones employees who only know how to serve burgers. Mm-hmm. Um, but and- also the clones are used as as uh you know. Uh, justification for going like the, the clones are a selling point because it's like these 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 men can like slap you the asses like of, the, of, the, of, the, right. of the servers yes. at your will right. right and there's some sort of like morality that has been completely abandoned yeah. in this future the people doesn't they, and we, these aren't people we right. see images sort of, yeah. of like new neo soul seems to have been built over like drowned original soul mm-hmm. or something yeah. it's like it's in sort of like a city in the sky it's almost. like a jetson city it's really yeah. it's it's cool yeah, it, so the cool. Wachowskis, yeah, these, we should say, directed, like literally on oh, set yes. directed the, the two stories we talked about, mm-hmm. the two future stories, right. and the furthest past story. Yeah, and Tom Tviker did the other three. Now, apparently, the up. three of them all, like, mapped out everything together before they got mm-hmm. to work. Yes. So I think, you know, they, they really considered themselves co-directors in every way. Yeah, but, but so, technically that was the they division. Were there, and the, yeah. the credits acknowledge it. The credits yeah. say... So she she realizes, she, is, she, becomes un, she becomes part of a revolution... Um, that sets that seeks to like expose the truth about these clones and like have the other people revolt against like the way that the clones are being treated. I didn't really understand the the broader picture of the revolution. Yeah. Like what was what were they revolt rebelling against other than the clones? I, that wasn't really clear to me. And is that brought up in the book? Uh, no, there's some sort of caste system and like there's this evil, uh, like empire which is called uh, what's it called? You know, they say uh, you know, fuck, what do they call it? I'm just- does everyone, um, you know, the, the pure blood thing is like, mm-hmm. uh, I can't, there's a word for it. It doesn't okay. matter. We can talk about it. There are these things called skirmishes, which is like, we see a little bit of it in the movie, that uh, segment where they're almost arrested by these like people with like black visors mm-hmm. and stuff. And then yeah. they like, there's cool shootouts and stuff. Are her, the civilians, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say her friend is like the first person, I, I don't know, ever, but like seemingly to sort of revolt against. I yeah. mean, there's a scene where a guy comes up and slaps her in the ass at the restaurant. This is her friend who like sneaks out at night. She's getting fucked by uh, Hugh Grant and mm-hmm. a horrible abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and uh, she like has a movie on her phone. Yes. Yeah. So, oh, she just, I think she just has a clip just of Just the movie. clip. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just oh, the, the movie, clip. I have the title now. It's called. Uh, the ghastly ordeal of Timothy Cavendish, and this, and is... in the movie, it's he's played by Tom Hanks, right? In the film, within the film, but it's the story of John, Jim Broadbent. This is a mm-hmm. ho- like a over the top adaptation of this Jim Broadbent's storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, but she gets her ass slapped one day at work, and like turns back and slaps the guy, and tries to escape. Tries to escape. Hugh Grant hits a button. Her collar just fucking like explodes, and her the blood squirts out of her neck. Gross. And it's really like nasty, okay, yeah. so this is th- these are the stakes. Mm-hmm. Like you're not free. Well, we should say there's never ass- seen you know the the world outside of their fast food restaurant, and they can choose to kill you at any time with the push of a mm-hmm. button. And obviously. we should also say this story is being recounted by Duna Bay to James Darcy, so right. we know that some sort of rebellion has already mm-hmm. happened. Yeah, she's yeah. like being interrogated. Yeah, yeah. I mean we, before we sh- her execution, we yes. don't have much time, so we should really just yeah. sum this one up. Yeah. I little, think we summed that no. one up. And well, then, but Jim uh, Sturgis, Sturgis, Sturgis is this handsome revolutionary. Yeah, who, who comes to her in. And, and they fall in love. And the revolution doesn't really no. work. No. no. But, the revolution fails. But some sort of seed takes executed. hold. But I mean, and I think in the books it's a little clearer that, like, apocalypse is coming to this civilization mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah. Like, because the thing is, and again, these stories all shake We also know that because we've seen the right. fucking Tom Hanks and, story. And we, we know that. In like, the apocalypse yeah. world, they worship the teachings of, of Duna Bay's character, who's called Soon Me uh, 451. And they like worship her big like, revolutionary speech that she yeah. gives. And as, she's, and as she's about to be executed, they're like, well, your, your voice doesn't matter. And she's right. like, no, it's already been heard, and that's all that matters. Right. Like, pe- right. this, yeah, like you said, the seed has been planted. And, every, and in every, I think in most of the aspects, there's that, in most of the stories, there's that ending, but it's, it's, it's more more eloquently yes. delivered it's a little in, more the, in that one right. that Jim Sturgis. Right, yes. whereas where some of the handshakes are a little goofy, like the, you know, Timothy Cavendish story playing out in this is a weird movie, within yeah. a movie which is great. I have yeah. no objection. It's just yeah. goofy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's that story. The present day story Yeah, is... the Timothy Cavendish story is 
I would probably say the weakest. Wouldn't would you agree? I would too, but it's got some I real like pleasure there. I, yeah, it, it, yeah. I like that it's there too. I think it's one thing. Why does Jim Broadbent say "ruddy" so much? He says it so I much. He won't say like any other swear word. Yeah, it's my ruddy car. You know what I do like about this story? Where are my ruddy keys? <laughs> I like that it has like Simpsons plotting where the first 25% of the story so has weird. almost nothing to do with the rest so of it. So it opens. It's so dense at the beginning it's a total mystery. This yeah. is in the first 15 minutes of the movie. We open at a book party, a book launch for right. a uh, an autobiography written by a London gangster played by Tom mm-hmm. Hanks. Of course. <laughs> and the book isn't doing well. He's sad. <laughs> he got a bad review, I mm-hmm. believe. He's He has a, the clip. In his pocket. Yeah. yeah, he's he's making flirty eyes with an Indian woman played by Halle Berry. Sure. That's why her not? full appearance in that <laughs> yeah. storyline is just looking real good. So Tom Hanks is in a sorry. Tom Hanks and yeah. I think we, we all love we probably all love Tom Hanks, right? Yeah, yeah, good guy. But you know, usually yeah. you especially in the nineties, especially when we grew up with him, an <laughs> yeah. actor who, you know, stuck to like one kind of like specific lane. And here he's really throwing himself, I feel like, at every weird role he takes on. Uh, and this is what I love about this movie is Tom Hanks started out as like a comedy actor. Yeah, he's sure. known for being one of the best SNL hosts ever. Totally. But totally. then in movies, he's usually like pretty straight line. Actually, an know? upstanding dude of some yeah. sort. Yeah. Yeah, and like other than the Lady Killers, maybe. Sure. Like since from 1990 on, Hanks is always playing an everyman or a subversion of an everyman. Mm. And then in this movie, you get to see him do like his fucking mad TV reel, and he you he know? throws a man, he throws the critic off well, a building and so kills yeah, him. That's kills the it. thing. I mean, you're you're watching this, and you're like, oh, this is weird, and Tom Hanks is really funny, but this is really strange. He's doing this Cockney mm-hmm. accent. Is this then just going to be a look inside, inside the, the critic, literary world? Throws yeah. him over the balcony. The critic explodes in like a it's like a bag of blood, like yeah. as he hits the ground. Yeah, it's he pink orders mist. two fingers of tequila. He yeah. does. He does yeah. put some salt on his, and this turns Jim Broadbent's character into a sensation because the book He's sales the go through yeah. the roof. Yeah, yeah, and right. because Tom Hanks is in prison, he's getting all of Tom Hanks's profits for this right, or right. revenue. But then a bunch of Guy Ritchie extras try to collect the money from Jim Broadbent. So we there goes, Guy Ritchie's just they're just his brothers. They're yeah. just his yeah. brothers, uh-huh. the Ritchies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so he asks his brother Hugh Grant in horrific old age makeup, craziest. But it's a really funny face. It, it's a funny face. It's, it he's got look, like a droopy dog face. Yeah. He looks like Droopy McCool from he the looks Max like Rebo band. McCool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a long conversation about the Max Rebo band yesterday. Yeah. Griffin and I and JD. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, um, and then so he gets put in an old folks. Home. So he okay, asks, they want money. They want yeah. money. He doesn't have it. He, he goes to his brother and his he's brother. like, the brother's like, you asked me for money all the time. I'm not giving it to you this and time. And you had sex like, with my wife. And you had sex with my wife. And then and then he realizes I could really fuck you over. And he's like, you know what? I will give you the money. Go to this hotel. We'll figure it out. Lay in the morning. low for a little while. Lay low. Yeah. But he doesn't realize that he's just signed his life away yeah. to this horrible old folks home which his brother which Grant has, yeah. a which his brother has a stake in yeah. yeah and so where everyone is just mistreated and it's it's prison for old people so that's the first 25 percent of that story and then the rest of that story is Breaking just up. jim broadbent trying to plan an escape Ga- from gathering old a bunch home. of senile folks mm-hmm. and trying to break out like the big action scene is this yeah. just them trying to figure out how to start a keyless car yeah. yes and like yeah. eventually figuring out that the button that says start is how you turn the car on and there's a very rewarding uh re- like with the with the old man who can only say what is the, he can only say one thing sort of guy yeah yeah but then at the end he like okay. yeah. finds his voice and right. helps them out and it's right. like very sweet but this one is the only one that's like done explicitly with it's voiceover comedy. narration yeah, yeah voiceover it's a comedy it's, it's explicitly supposed to be funny I feel like it's got like the jaunty aren't. music yeah. it's farcical and it's got this sort of through line that we talked about where he's like, oh, and also I remember like all of a sudden he's like, yeah. I remember when I was a kid and I wanted to hook up with uh, this lady. And then like I held a cat over my like uh, genitals when and the parents rumbled. And, like you the, get this like scene out of nowhere. The cat scratches his dick. He falls out a window and then he makes a really good pussy joke. Yeah. And then and then he's just like, so that's why I never uh, saw her again. And you're like, that's that's why you never saw her again. That feels like a reason to see her in the again. book. Uh, this, this, I had a question for you since you'd read it. Okay. In the book, is is this a movie? Is this adapted yes. into a movie? So yes. it is a movie yeah. within the book. Um, yeah. And and uh, in the book, it's more. She doesn't get to watch it until Duna Bay's character uh, Sunmi mm-hmm. doesn't get to watch it until the end of her story. It's like her reward before yeah. she dies. There's, she gets th- to watch the movie. There's something like you can understand why the Wachowskis and Tviker would be into this because it's like in the other in the other instances in the other stories you've got. Uh, her story, like Soon Mi's story, her story, um, her story. Mm-hmm. Soon Mi's uh, uh, acts are what have caused ripple effects. Mm-hmm. And it's like all these actions, like these brave actions have caused ripple effects. But in this one, it's like a movie 
right. yeah. is what has the transformative uh, you thing, know, persisted right. throughout right. all these generations. And is what inspires yeah. soon me. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like his story itself only has an effect on like eight people. Right, right. But then the movie that's adapted for because you the presume movie. he yeah. writes a book out of yes. mm-hmm. this story. It's, the book is funny. It becomes a movie. The movie is this Frank Capra esque like noble. I will not be like yeah. imprisoned against my and will. And people are right. affected by it. And it's for the power generations of yeah. art. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so that's that storyline. Okay, so the, the previous storyline, the San Francisco storyline, is probably the simplest in a weird sort of way. Because yeah. it's just like this supposed to be this kind of like hard-boiled like mystery like silk thriller. Woody. In yeah, the yeah. Book, yeah, like a Silkwood kind yeah. of thing. Exactly. In the book, it is subtitled A Louisa Ray Mystery yeah. as mm-hmm. if there's a series of Louisa Ray Mysteries. Well, and right? we yeah. see that Frobisher – I mean, not Frobisher, fuck, sorry. Uh, you know, Cavendish, the yeah. publisher in the next story, wants to publish one of these Louisa yeah. Ray Mysteries. That's yes. the handshake there. Right. So it's Halle Berry. She's the daughter of a famous journalist. She's a journalist. Yeah. But she's kind of a – she kind of just does um, – she does puffy yeah, stuff. Yeah, she's just puffy right, stuff. Right. Yeah, she's trying to be more glass serious. Magazine. Spy glass magazine. <laughs> yeah, and the other puffy stuff she does is marijuana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she likes marijuana. It's the 70s, baby. Yeah, puffing that dank she weed. She has like a kid friend who lives above yeah. her. Yeah, yeah that, maybe my least favorite element of the film. Not sure why yeah. that's in there. Yeah. A lot of stuff in this movie. Yeah, yeah. I just don't like that kid. Uh, he's and bad. Yeah, I, he's, it's not a great performance. It's, just, it's a very stage you know, mom coach performance. She's trying to expose this nuclear power plant that's like unsafe or whatever. It's unsafe. Intentionally, so and owned by coal companies or oil companies, right? To, to, to so destroy does, nuclear power's yeah. like yeah. reputation. So that when this nuclear power plant like melts down and kills hundreds of thousands of people, no one will trust nuclear power again. We'll They'll only have the use oil and coal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the handshake the, there is that yeah. James Darcy's character, who is younger in the previous story, is now old and like wants to expose, but gets assassinated. Yeah. But, like. And but the I feel like the crucial point of this story is the the, the music itself. Yes, is that that she is drawn to this music, mm-hmm. the Cloud Atlas sex step. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which recurs through all the movies, but this is the one where it's like physical, where the yeah. person listens to it a bunch. Yeah, and, and it's like talked yeah. about. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. this music is so familiar, but like so rare and, like and the, strange. The, yeah. the guy at the record shop hears it for the first right. time, and he's like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, but then at the at the Crazy. book party where Tom Hanks throws the guy at yeah. the window, the band is playing a right. song, lyric set to that. Uh, in the Neo Soul story, Jim Broadbent's an old blind musician playing right. it on his future his future <laughs> organ. Yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> and I think that's 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 one of the most impressive things about it to me because it's. Uh, I was thinking about uh, Stranger Than Fiction. Remember that movie? Of course. Yeah, we talked about it in the last Mentioned episode. It last week. And so, so last week. Yeah. But you know, like any time uh, a movie tries to represent, uh, you know, high art. And it's never quite right. And in, and in Stranger Than Fiction, the Emma it's Thompson a, character is supposed to be this like beloved, this you know, like wonderful novelist. And yeah, every like, every every quote you get from it is awful. Yeah, and it sounds like it's written sucks. by like a freshman yeah. in college. It's it's. I mean, I was we and Griffin were just talking about that because we were talking about this yeah. movie, and I was talking about Mr. Holland's Opus. I don't know if you've seen Mr. Oh, Holland's course. Opus, but you know when the Opus is finally played mm-hmm. at the end, and it's kind of a little underwhelming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. blows chunks. <laughs> um, but in this, it's like they they managed to create a piece of music that does sound like the type of thing that would be that inspirational. And, and as know, we we get to the next the next plot, which is about the yeah. composing of that music by this. Uh, this uh, young English composer, Robert Frobisher, yeah. uh, the who is a great homosexual, Benjamin Wishaw. who is working as an amanuensis to mm-hmm. Jim Broadbent's grumpy old composer of something, Vivian Ayres or Vivian something. Ayers. And I love the structure of this one, which is we start with him and James Darcy in bed. The hotel manager's knocking on the door. Well, they we don't actually get start caught. with him committing suicide in a bathtub. Oh, yeah. right. Yes, and we flash. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he slips out the window with just the guy's waistcoat, right? right? Mm-hmm. And he's about to go on this trip. To go work with a composer, right. and the rest of this uh, story is told through letters that he's writing to James Darcy, mm-hmm. who's his great love that he can't be with. Which mm-hmm. is are these letters are then discovered by somebody by by, is it by, by Halle Berry? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, right. so there's a lot of, but he composes this music. In the, composes it. while he's working for Broadbent's composer. Broadbent's character. like a great composer who's sort of gone to he's like old. In, in the books, I think it's more clear that he's like blind and syphilitic. Like he's yeah. like a gross old man. Um, but so he's sort of giving him scraps, and Ben Wishaw's turning him into something more. And he thinks this relationship can become some sort of symbiotic thing where he helps him out, and then eventually. Uh, Broadbent will throw the spotlight back onto him and give him the spotlight for this grand opus that he's working on, which is the Cloud Atlas Sextet. It is his magnum opus. It is the defining work of his life. And so Mm -hmm. the music for this film was composed by Tweaker. Mm -hmm. Tweaker and his friend... 
I, I forget his name. But it know. sounds like a terrible idea. I mean, as uh, you yeah, said yeah, yesterday, uh, David, Reinhold like, Hale and Johnny it shouldn't have been. Klamek. This shouldn't have been good. Yeah, no. this music shouldn't have been. good. When you hear that the music's going to be crucial, you're like, oh, who are they going to get? Bet, like, yeah. what big name composer are they going to bring in for this? Yeah. And I bet David Mitchell was like, that's going to be the hardest thing. That's sure, going to be your right. hardest you're job. You need to nail that, right? Because yeah. in the book, obviously, yeah. you, know, you just go, it's the best music you've ever heard. It's a crazy haunting piece of music that recurs throughout centuries. Great. But you said yesterday when we were talking about it, you were like, can you imagine the meeting where they're like, what are you going to do about the music? And then one of the three directors is like, I'll take care of it. No, I, I got it. I got it. Yeah. 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 Scene, <laughs> scene run, Lola run, did that. Yeah. Because like fucking, you know, like Clint Eastwood and Robert Rodriguez scored their own films. And when you watch those movies, you're like, yeah, this is. Yeah, Clint Eastwood put like, a finger on his, right, on his exactly. piano. Right. That's how he scores it his movies. Like yeah. It feels like an afterthought. It feels like the director just being like, I just want to get this finished. Let me just. I do feel like Eastwood, he did, didn't he eventually stop doing it? Because like, I think even he realized like, yeah, me just strumming on a guitar for five Grand minutes. Torino may have been his last one. <laughs> yeah. Because the Grand Torino song from Grand Torino is the craziest thing in the world. Oh, the one that he kind of like yeah. warbles. Grand Torino. Grand Torino. <laughs> Grand Torino. <laughs> no, but, it's so weird. But you know what? No, he did do the music for American Sniper. No. Oh, he did? Yes, he did because there's there's a track at the end. There's the cue that he wrote at the end of American Sniper uh-huh. over the footage that I think is really good and they've never released. I'm looking for it. The music? It's, it's the thing I like most about American Sniper. I like Bradley Cooper's performance in that. Yeah, film. he's good in that. Yeah, and I, think I like Sam it when Miller's there was that weird too. baby that everyone made fun of. Yeah, that movie's just confusing. I don't really remember it to be honest. <laughs> no, and I saw it. I uh, saw it twice because I just want to have some solid opinion about it, and it's still just so nebulous in my mind. W- what else is? Who was? What's the name of the other guy? Zweiker's friend. Uh, so, the by the way, movie. Eastwood did not compose the music, but he composed one theme. In oh, the, so in it's just this end theme, theme that I can't Some fu- other guy did. It's not on the soundtrack. I don't soundtrack. remember that. Yeah, it's called Tanya's it's theme. It's really good. Anyway, yeah. uh, the fine. Wait, well, should we say anything more about the wish shot? I, I feel like we just want to get everything down because we're running out of time. Yeah, I mean, but he's, like, he's uh, you know, trying to write this magnum opus and he hoping realizes, to get back to his, his love. He realizes Vivian is just going to screw him, so he yeah. tries to kill him. He doesn't. Yes, right. he's on the he run. Shoot the, him though. He's r- shoots him. He's he on the run. He also tries to fuck him. I mean, he's like can't yeah. figure out yeah, where emotionally for, he stands. Like, yeah, with what do this I got to do? What do I got to do? Is he my enemy? Like, is he my lover? I'm he's also having you an affair. As a also yeah. having an affair with his wife, Halle Berry, played mm-hmm. by Halle Berry. Now, in the book, that affair is more fleshed out. Okay. Yeah, and is a big deal. It's a little thrown away, and is more of the problem, like the affair. Whereas in this, it seems to be more like artistic jealousy than it is like emotional jealousy. And but, the affair um, in this is sort of thrown out as just sort of like he feels indebted to them. It's yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he says it's just a. He says it's just physical. It's just. It's not like I'm in mm-hmm. love with this woman because he tells the, the, the yeah. boyfriend that. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. But the Six thing seven. is, and you know, he's doomed because it does start with. For a movie that's already playing so much of time, almost every story kind of starts in media rest or something yeah. like. And it starts with him in a bathtub about to kill himself. And you kind of know he might not make it. Like, yeah. And the way these letters sound is almost like it's like long goodbye to his lover. But he and kills we, himself after completing the, he does. the composition. And we yeah. connected that uh, Darcy gives the documents, uh, is the entryway into the story for Louisa Ray. Yes. And the sequence that I fucking love, there's like an, a Where long scene with them in an elevator, which yeah. A... I like any scene that's shot with one dominant color. Right, which is red. Like the yeah. lights go off mm-hmm. and it's red, which sort of gets back to, I think, this Wachowski idea of like we're all the same. Because mm-hmm. if like you're in bright red like that, then like the color of your skin is no longer visible. Mm-hmm. And it's the idea that she like is – I'm sort of harp on this scene, but I just like the scene a lot. I know it's we're really moving good. backwards. It's a great scene. It's really, but really good. She comes out of a hallway. They live – She he lives in the same building as her. She's at a party. This guy's hitting on her. She's clearly like – fucking mm-hmm. men Some like famous uh, guy yeah like i can't fucking deal with this gets mm-hmm. in the elevator he holds the thing open for her she's like nice to see the chivalry isn't dead mm-hmm. he of course we know is a gay man mm-hmm. and she's in this safe zone where in a world where everything's like a threat to her mm-hmm. either like a physical threat or a sexual threat here's this man who like treats her with respect mm-hmm. and right. listens to her appreciates her, her like her. career yeah and they're just in this red box mm-hmm. you know having this connection and at the end of it he sort of as, as they talk about journalistic principles how far she'd go with her story, the responsibility she feels to the people. Mm -hmm. He decides as an old man with very little to lose, you know, who's already lost his great love, has been Mm -hmm. living in the wake of this, to give her the first key to this story Mm -hmm. because he thinks she can save the people. Right. Yeah, I just love that. No, I love it too. And I think that's the, you know, the makeup is always a little goofy, but like old Darcy looks okay. I think it's probably the best makeup job. Probably the best makeup job. Yeah. Also, apart from the future people, apart from Hugh Grant Cannibal, which 
I think is a tremendous makeup it's job. Under, yeah. It's but the I think they overaged him because like in the time like the yeah. timeline it's only like thirty five yes. years. It's thirty five. Like, he looks like he's ninety. <laughs> he yeah. does look like and the he old. should he should be about sixty. But I something. think I think yeah you're right yeah I think yeah. they went over the top yeah. with it. Heartache ages you, you know. Yeah. Heartache ages. That's true. He's um, had a sad life. Yeah. And then the final story, or do you want? Oh no, I'm no, 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 no. The final story in 1849 in the Pacific Islands. Yeah. Is about. He he's a lawyer, I think. Like yeah. he's like a businessman of some sort, played by Tom Sturgis. He's got uh-huh. like a nice suit and hat. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he's gone to the Chatham Islands, which is like off the coast of New Zealand, to negotiate Make something. A deal. Yeah, and he like has this encounter with a stowaway slave on the ship when he's going back to England. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they form a connection, and he like saves this slave's life. Because slavery. evil Tom Hanks is trying to kill yeah. Jim Sturgis to right. like steal his you know treasures. Right, yeah. a lot of stuff's going. But like, Tom he's, Hanks he's is like a crooked doctor. Yeah, so he's, he's slowly, slowly poisoning, poisoning him. So like he will die, and then he'll just take. A and he wrote these letters that are, are being read by six uh, by Frobisher in the next story. That you know Jim Sturgis's yes. character mm-hmm. and 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 only Fro- half of them. Right, and Frobisher's like can't really intent on book. finding out what they happened. They were published. Yes. Right. Yeah, and it's this sort of great account. Yeah. And you've got like Jim Broadbent is like a mean ship captain, and there's this really yeah. fun sequence where David Giassi like scales the sails of the ship and like yeah. does all well, this crazy Well, did we set up David Giassi's character? He's a, yeah. a slave stowaway. Mm-hmm. They're planning on killing him. Well, he, he shows up in Jim Sturgis's room. Yes. They didn't even know he was on the boat. Because mm-hmm. before they dock, they get to they're on land, and and Jim Sturgis has to watch this guy getting whipped, and it's like this is horrible. Mm-hmm. But he sort of just turns an eye, you know, and goes along as if nothing happened. This guy stows away on the ship, and he's like, "Please, please, please, my life is in your hands. Don't kill me." And Sturgis is like, "You're skilled. I I should tell them that you're here so they can hire you as a hand." Mm-hmm. And he's like, "Okay, if you're so good on a ship, then why don't you, you know, lower impress us, lower the sails." And he like starts climbing up. What this guy's the fucking most physically impressive dude I've ever seen. Oh, maybe he's in Channing great Tato. shape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's doing like crazy shit with like just one rope, and he's like climbing. A it's whole a really mass. cool scene. Um, and the second he starts climbing, Jim Broadbent's like, "Give me my fucking gun. Give me my whiskey. I'm right, gonna right. And we're gonna dude. shoot this guy. Oh, no, I don't think he. Well, I think doesn't he ask someone to shoot? It doesn't matter. Whatever. Yeah. 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 But the plan is like he's like, "What you just said? You give him a chance." He's like, "I don't fucking care. Right. Right. He's mm-hmm. a slave. I'm yeah. not gonna do that." And Jim Sturgis, in this moment, you know, sort of knocks him off trajectory. Mm-hmm. The guy drops the sail, and they realize how impressive he is. Right. And Jim Sturgis saves this man's life right. by giving him, you know, freedom. And that's the thing about, now that we've covered all, that's the thing about these movies. These, like, little things kind of build over, like, you know, like we like ripples. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like they, small they sort of... Kind of. Right. Then, they, well, there's no such thing as a small act is kind of what it's yeah. also right. saying. Right. Exactly, right. And, I mean, the final is it the final line of the movie it's a crucial line in the book and it's definitely one of the last lines of the movie where uh he's saying like this character is reunited with his wife fiance duna yeah. bay redhead and says like i'm going to be an abolitionist like i don't think like which is know, let's say probably the worst makeup job in the entire film it she looks like raggedy and she looks awesome. um yeah uh, and uh, like, and he says, "I'm, you know, I'm going to be an abolitionist, and I, I decry the slave movement." I think Hugo Weaving, Hugo Weaving, is the one who's like, "Are you kidding me? Like, you know, yeah. you'll be a drop in an ocean Mr. or whatever." Mr. Anders, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, "Like, what is the ocean if not a multitude of drops?" Yeah. Or what, yeah, like, yeah, and that's beautiful. And like, I re- and I'll that's like, the idea, right? That's I, the whole fucking idea. It's great. I, 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 my story about seeing in the theater was incomplete because I sobbed at that line. Yeah. It's a great I line. I sobbed at it. And like and like it, it's it seems like a very easy cloying little thing, but yeah. it it's so effective, especially after two and a half hours. Well this is the thing. I feel like a lot of the things in this movie when described sound cheesy yeah. or they sound easy even yeah. like or like they sound like a little too obvious. But like the whole impact of the movie is that you're seeing this like you it it all works because it's all mm-hmm. together. And like when like when it's built to that after three hours and you're music- like so in and the music is with yeah. you and yeah. <sighs> You know, when you see the closing credits and you're like, oh, there's Tom Hanks. He was that one and that guy. <laughs> yeah, they do sort of a who's who I in the closing that. credits. I mean, here's a, here's a thing for me, okay? Uh, you know, I like overanalyzing these things, psychoanalyzing these things. And I know you hate it when I do this. No, I don't always hate it. I just um, sometimes hate it. I think, the, hate it. I think this one's fine. I think you won't have objections. Ben, oh, yeah, feel shoot, better. Shoot. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, harumph, harumph. Um, we've talked about in our Matrix episode. Mm. 
how the first Matrix film spawned a lot of bad things from people who misinterpreted what was going on in the film. Right? Yeah, absolutely. The men's right movement. I mean, uh, Columbine was blamed uh, on the Matrix, not, which I think was incorrect. Let's not say that the Matrix completely spawned the men's right movement, but they certainly took but the red pill. Uh, yeah, there were the all these elements that people thing, misinterpreted, yes. right? Yeah, Ma- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The Matrix didn't create bad people, but bad people looked at the Matrix and were like, this is reaffirming that thing I believe, mm. and misinterpreted the film and then did shitty things in the name of yeah. the Matrix. Okay. And even the worst of all was just uh, the new metal movement, but, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but what's your point about this movie? Okay, so then uh, The Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions becomes super philosophical and like away from the cool badass stuff. And then Speed Racer and Cloud Atlas, and I think this continues on to Jupiter Ascending, and certainly Sense8 from what I understand, although that's the thing I haven't seen yet. Me neither. Have you seen Sense8, no. Bobby? Yeah, no. no. I think Sense8's kind of doing the same thing as this, except no makeup this time, right? It's just right. different people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they switch minds within yes. different yes. bodies. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, they become so thoroughly unconcerned with seeming cool. Mm. They become so achingly sincere, which is a term I've used before. But That's a good point, use. though, because Speed Racer is like that, uh, yeah. certainly. Speed Racer is this very open-hearted, like, a yeah. straightforward, uh, emotional movie. And yeah. there are all these, like, desperate pleas for people to look around and respect each other and realize that, like, The Matrix was this narrative of the one. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to save everyone. Your job is to save everyone because everyone's important, but it's still putting one person on the pedestal. The rest of the movies become about, like, everyone's fucking important. Every life is important. Mm-hmm. The way we all treat each other is important, you know? Everyone, um, is, everyone is given a, the opportunity to be, like, the hero. But yes. then, in seeing the way everyone interacts, you realize that everyone was already a hero to begin with. Right. And it's this idea I talked about in the Speed Racer episode, where at the end, the reason why that final race doesn't play out as, like, an underdog moment for Speed Racer to win is it's as much about his family winning. It's about this guy yeah, who they right. believed in and who they love wins, and they most of that Speed sequence, Racer. beautiful film, you'll cry. But but and in this movie, I think there's also that weird optimism of like, even if Tom Hanks is a mean old quack in this yeah. story, like you know, there's a chance for progression, and there's a chance for like heroism to mm-hmm. like you know sort of take root over several generations and like maybe pay off. You know, like mm-hmm. progress is possible. But these movies feel like them constructing like a uh, hundred million dollar soapboxes to stand up and go like, please be kind to each other. Which so many people, like, who have, I think, turned against their works are like, that's fucking corny and it's cheesy. And they go in broad strokes. But it's clearly so impassioned and genuine. Yeah. You know? And it's like, either this movie's going to work for you or it's not. But for me, I think all three of us, when you hit that final line and it's so simple and it's so direct. And Jim Sturgis is a guy who's good at, like, when he's misused, he feels like a wet blanket. But if given the right words like this, it's like, he just Mm -hmm. feels like a really good guy. Yeah, what do you think of Sturgis? Bobby, I, I'm not a big fan of Jim Sturgis. I think he's fun in this. In this. I, I think, think I'm with I, you. I think he's good in this. I was, I, I found myself thinking about him for the first time in a long time while rewatching it this morning. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, I, I like you, but yeah. I don't really understand like I mean, why I, why I. He's just, yeah. fine. I think he's, he's fine. just, he's kind yeah. of fine. I mean, I he's, he's about fine. to be in a TV show. I hadn't thought about him for a while, but he's about yeah. to be in. Uh, Oh, the Sturgis and Schwimmer Mark. make the yeah. food or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's that's called. what's called. That's the when did, he, when did he make one day? We, I'm, he made I, one day right after this. Right made, after this. That was sort of his last of, big it. leading man thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that then that bombed. Uh, yeah. Let's briefly. We should wrap up, but let's briefly talk about the box office. Yeah, and then there are two other segments I want to do, but we'll let's oh, talk Jesus. about the box office. Okay, because yeah. it's one p.m. <laughs> I know. Okay. We'll, we'll be out of here. All right, forget the box office. What segments do you want? No, let's talk about the box office. Well, it opened. To nine point six million, Awful. it was such a bummer. Awful. It just, Awful. it just, it actually did well over net overseas. It, yeah. it, it made about one hundred and ten overseas, so it like totally collected like one hundred and thirty or something like that. Yeah, but it made twenty seven mil. Yeah, that's uh, terrible. They thought it was going to do like twenty million opening weekend, which right. still would have been low for how much the film cost. Mm-hmm. And then like the reasonable expectations were like the lowest it would go is like fifteen, and then the storm hit and it was like nine, and the movie never recovered. So can you give me the five? Can you release? Number so, one is a movie that had been number two the previous week. <laughs> oh, really? It Very jumped rare. Up? Yes. Okay, so it's 2012. It's October. Mm-hmm. Is it a horror film? Nope. It's an Oscar winning film. Argo. Yes. Okay. Number one. Number two, Cloud Atlas. Okay. Number three is a film you've talked about multiple times on this podcast. I know exactly what film it is. It is Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> <laughs> number four is a horror film that had been number one the previous week and obviously collapsed like 70%, you know. Uh, Insidious 2? No, fair guess. <laughs> it's one of those, you know. Yeah. Sinister? No. Sinister is number nine. Oh, really? Yeah. Give me a slight hint. It's a four. A, a Paranormal Activity yeah. 4. Yeah. And then number five is another horror movie that, uh, I mean. So we have three horror movies in the top ten simultaneously? October. Yeah, 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 yeah. But even it is October. October. It is October. Uh, give, give me one hint on the other horror. It's a sequel adaptation of a video game, 
it's oh, just, Silent Hill, whatever it's called, Resurrection. Uh, Re- Revelation, I Revelation. believe. We John, forgot about that with one. With Jon Snow yeah. and uh, maybe other people. Is Rhonda Mitchell back in that one? Or? No, I think it's Adelaide Clemens, maybe, or someone like that. I it's one of our, our young stars of right. tomorrow. But, you know, I mean, it's no surprise. And it seems like if the storm was when, like, if that was part of it, then yeah, it seems like well, everything sort of conspired against this movie anyway. But There's a literal storm, and I forgot also the storm of Hotel Transylvania. I mean, that <laughs> film, there was just chaos in the wake of it. It was impossible for any other movie to open after HT, you but, know? But I forgot about this. Everyone we, was checking in. But we do have to do it. For a two-week stay. We do have to do the burger report. The suite. Right? That's one of the things you want to do. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it quickly. So okay. then we have three segments. I'll do Burger Report quickly. Oh, you have two other segments? Yeah, fuck. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, Griffin. All right. Uh, and we also have a book report, but we'll read that next week. Yeah, we're not doing that yeah. this week. Uh, I went to Hollyweird recently. Yeah. Do you know about the Burger Report, Bobby? It's where we talk about uh, yeah. burgers. Yeah, yeah, okay. But when we see famous eating burger. So you yeah, went to Hollyweird. I want to hear the story, though. You went to Hollyweird. You were looking. You were you were trying to start a Burger Report. I was in Hollyweird for two days, right? I had to do a t- table read for the tech. And I had, like, I flew out, we did rehearsals, we did the table read, and then the next day, my flight wasn't until 10 p.m. So I had a full day. I had to check out of the uh, hotel at, like, noon. So I had, like, eight hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had eight hours until I was going to get picked up to go to the airport. And I decided I'm going to leave my bags at the front desk, I'm going to throw on my sunglasses, I'm going to do an eight-hour burger crawl. I'm going to go to as many burger places as I can. I only ate two. I ate one for lunch, I ate one for dinner. Right. Right? All right. No, I didn't even get one for lunch. I only ate one for dinner, okay? Uh, so literally what I was doing, I was a uh, skittish uh, young man mm-hmm. wearing sunglasses <laughs> with a heavy backpack, walking into burger places, scanning the horizon, and immediately walking out. So I think everyone called 911 after I left. <laughs> Uh, I looked like someone, like a like a like someone pl- planning my next domestic terrorist uh, <laughs> No, location. I understand. I understand. Um, but I, I lost track at a certain point. I think I went to... At least 12 burger places, perhaps 15. Wow. What? But what were you doing in these places? Walking in, scanning, walking out. Oh, I see. So you didn't take seats in it. Oh, okay. No. Okay. I mean, at one place, like halfway through, I got a beer, you know? At one place, I used the bathroom. I understand. But I didn't want to spend money on Ubering, so I would like, okay, what's the closest place? I'd sure. yelp that. I'd walk there. And I'd go, what's the next closest place? I'd walk there. This filled up eight hours. Okay. Okay? But no sightings. I'm going through all of them. Fucking nothing right mm-hmm. and i'm going all over the place i'm going chains i'm going local i'm going mm-hmm. hole in the wall i'm mm-hmm. going like bars that serve burgers right okay. I'm, everywhere fucking all right all nothing. right no one's eating up no one famous is eating a burger no famous anywhere then... okay so then i'm walking and i like had one last place i was gonna go to and i was like and then i'm gonna get the fucking lift to come pick me up from this place bring it back to the hotel go to the airport right and i'm walking to this final place and then i look and i see a sign <gasps> This is a burger place. It says burger on the signage, but this didn't show up on my Yelp. Okay. What's this place called? Plan Check. That's a plan check. That's a weird thing. That's weird. Wait, this feels like a sign from the gods. My podcast is it's a called- sign from the gods and also the worst name burger joint I've ever heard of. Yeah, but, but plan, that's why. P-L-A-N. Check. Okay, so you go into- A mere two letters off. You go into Plan Check Kitchen and Bar on Fairfax Avenue or Wilshire Boulevard? Uh, I think it was the one on Fairfax. Okay. And I sit down very close to the door, and I go, I'm going to keep my head on a swivel. I had a delicious yeah, burger. Course. An unbelievable burger. I think I got the plan check burger, the titular one, mm-hmm. which had salt on the bun, which fun. was interesting, fun. fun, and delicious. Sort of a pretzel bun or just a, a, a salted a bun? A regular bun with salt. Oh, I see it. It looks very nice. It was a great fucking burger. Can you swivel that, uh, that screen over, David? Yeah, this is a chicken burger. Yeah. But, uh, <gasps> but you oh. get the idea. You get the yeah, idea. It was delicious. Mm-hmm. I got waffle fries. I had some delicious local. Did it come in this little cast, cast iron? Beers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very cute. Yeah, very I cute. love this place. It, it was hip. Great. And I'm there. I'm getting there like seven o'clock, right? And I was like, okay, I need to leave for the airport in like an hour. Mm-hmm. Head in a swivel. Look around. A bunch of young hip people are coming in. I was like, this feels good. This place feels like a hot spot. It's a Friday night or Saturday night. It's a bar. It's a, fucking people are coming in. I'm eating my burger. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. This is where it's meant to be. And who walks in? I got to know. Jacob Robinson. Don't know who that yeah, is. <laughs> He's one of my, my dad's old uh, graduate students at NYU. My dad teaches at NYU. And it was. That, that's it? Yeah, I came uh. up short. I went to fucking 15 burger places. Did you talk to him? No, I didn't. I, I wasn't sure if you remembered me. All so right. Well, know. maybe we shouldn't end on such a, um, you know. Well, Griffin, do you have any other things you want to do? Well, not I was going to add, report. I yes. have a burger report. Okay. Okay. Go on, Ben. But I, I don't want to, you know, add too much time here. 
Uh, but it was it came up in the book that we were referencing the book reports, M. Night Shyamalan's book about education. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so in the book, uh, one of our fans referenced on Twitter that he actually went to the Spotted Pig. Right. You you mentioned this to me. That, that was a, a haunt of his. M. Night in the book said it was a regular haunt of filmmakers. Then you used to work at the Spotted Pig, Bobby, just huh? for okay. Yeah. okay. So I actually never... You never saw him. I never saw him. You may but, not have been looking for him, Ben. But, but the but. story doesn't end there because... As a bartender, you have to help stock the bar, and that includes grabbing fruit. Okay. Sure, now, lemons. Now, perhaps, let's say M. Night Shyamalan one night, he came in, he had a burger, and okay. he was like, I'm going to have a Manhattan. Okay. He ordered it with the orange twist. Mm-hmm. I handled those oranges. <laughs> Boom. We're, 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 we're telling some stories with a the land with a real claw. So, Ben, your story is if he were to have maybe, ordered a see drink, that maybe his lips touch an orange that you had once touched. That's right. Well, that's not a burger report. That's a that's a fruit all right, fact. All right, all right. Bobby has something fact, he wants it was to a say. Twist. Well, it's not a burger report, but yeah. I I can tell a really quick Let's story shoot. that is not my story about Please. an orange twist in Manhattan. <laughs> So this is now, this is the orange twist. I will try to do this in 30 seconds. Yeah, this is, twist. is not, we're, I'm not good at this. We're timing this, you. this is a new segment. It's called the orange twist file. <laughs> this is the orange twist. A friend of mine uh, was in LA yeah. uh, for whatever reason. The City of Angels. She was waiting. She was at uh, Sunset Towers. That's where she was staying. Uh-huh. Yeah. She was at the bar. She was waiting for her wife. Yeah. And was at the bar, was just getting a Manhattan alone, ordered a, it was very crowded because it was an event going on. It was a, a, a wedding outside. That was of a, a, a person who was friends with a famous person. So there were famous people at the wedding. Mm-hmm. But they were not like super famous people. They were Mark McGrath level famous people. Okay. okay. So Mark McGrath was one of the guests. <laughs> she orders. <laughs> the so very friend, level. As it should be. Mark my friend uh, is. And he said, uh, I am the median. My friend befriends Mark McGrath's, Mark McGrath's wife, not knowing it is Mark McGrath's wife. So they're talking at the bar. She orders. The wife is very drunk. She orders a rye Manhattan. Oh. And oh. she hears a man say, what's that? <laughs> That man was Mark McGrath. Oh my God, Bobby! And so, sorry. They be, they have, this is like Cloud Atlas. All the stories time. are shaking yeah. each they other's hands. Time. They like talk. She <laughs> talks. She be friends. Mark McGrath. He's very nice. So is his wife. Good to know. Her 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 her, her rye Manhattan comes. It's not a twist of an orange. It is a slice of an orange. You know, floating, garnishing on. It's, oh, it's stuck garnish, on the garnish, garnish. And Mark McGrath says, "I feel bad because this isn't my story, no, but, no, I'm, but I'm taking but, it." Mark McGrath says. Is that toast? <laughs> In a million years, I couldn't have predicted that. Fingers. And she said, "No, it's an orange slice." <sighs> and he did. He say, "Oh, cool." I don't know. I don't know what he was. Yeah, the, the story. Was, uh, they, 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 they. That's where the letters. Bit. If we were reading the letters, is they that, were just cut off. <laughs> is that toast? <laughs> is that toast? <laughs> Uh, that's great. That's a great story. Uh, if you have any orange twist, <laughs> if you have any orange twist stories, you just tweeted us blank check. Pod. If you're uh, if you're Can listening to this in the future, yeah. um, hey, what's up? Uh, this is how we were living in 2016. <laughs> so this is thank you, Ben. If you have a case you want to report to the orange twist file. <laughs> Submit your case. Griffin, I'm desperate to know. Well, we can save the book report for the Jupiter Ascending yeah, episode. We'll but do that. what was the other thing you wanted to do? I want to do a speed round performance review where we just picked which performance oh. from each actor was our favorite. <laughs> well, that's well, all right. Well, that's pretty easy, actually. But, so. but I think there's a more important segment if we're only going to do one. Oh. Well. For the first time ever, a guest has perhaps come in preloaded with their own merchandise spotlight oh, oh I forgot. we there forgot is, about there that. is a piece of merchandise in this film that i didn't even know existed yeah, but bobby yeah. has coveted well, bobby i feel like was i want to tell me about this I off mic the spotlight you want to talk about I it, so it. I, I won't spend the money on it um merchandise while spotlight. i was rewatching it this morning uh i noticed that there was you know they had when holly Berry goes to the record the store, record store mm-hmm. to buy the cloud atlas sextet it's like packaged very nicely, and I was like, "Oh, I wonder it's if pretty." It's got like weird sort of it's colors, it's and really it's like pretty. a mountainy kind of. It's very cool. And so I don't, I don't know why it, it made me think like, "Oh, I wonder if they actually made this, if they, if they actually pressed it, and this is a playable version of the sex set." And I, it they sounded like, like something. Things. It sounded like something. They I mean, would the do. Speed Racer car was a drivable car. They yeah. like to make things. Yeah. So I started just do like some very you know, preliminary googling about it and trying to see if it was real. Turns out they did. Use it. They did press it. They pressed a limited number of copies. Uh-huh. They sold them originally for like, uh, I think it was only on sale in the UK, and they sold it for like 30 euro is where I found people mm-hmm. talking about it in 2012. Ben sounds like he's dying, um, by the way. There aren't <laughs> many left. There aren't many left. Mm-hmm. And if you want to buy it now, you can find it on eBay. You can find it new, and it's about $300. Ooh. 
Uh, it's I think Griffin just smiled with interest. <laughs> there is one on eBay right now. Uh, the auction ends probably around 2 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. I'm going to keep my eye on it. Mm. It was currently at about $50 oh. with eight bids with 36 hours to That's go. That's going to go high, Griff. That's going to go so That's going to go high. I have a green Hugo weaving over my shoulder right now going, you better buy it now. <laughs> Buy it now option. Make an offer. It's new. It's When's factory. It going to be available again? <laughs> What's the reserve? Yeah. It's factory sealed, but it has a crease on the upper right corner. Yeah. You can handle that. Yeah. Yeah. You're so, a superhero. What else are you going to spend I'd money on? Is it the whole score or is it literally the it's sex It's four step? track. It's okay, the sex so it's set the and then a couple step. other things. Cool. They just filled, they filled the vinyl. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, great merchandise spot. Like, you don't want to yeah. do a, a rapid performance review? Yeah, let's do it. It's okay, really, so I, go through each actor. You pick your favorite performance. Favorite Sturgis. I, I weirdly think it's Neo Soul. Me too. Yeah. I, I think as, I, I might be that. I as think problematic so. as his look it, it, is. The look yeah. is, but he's quite dynamic yeah. in yeah. that. Yeah, he's really, it's a, it's a movie star I, performance. Wish Shaw is obviously the composer. Yeah, he yes. kills. That's, yeah. that's really his only big role. Yeah. Uh, and Barry is probably Louisa Ray, right? Oh, she, Ray. I think she's very nice in the future. The she's big in the future. I think Louisa Ray is my favorite. I, I think Louisa Ray might be my favorite Halle Berry performance ever. I was going to I was gonna say that she's very good. I think she's really good. It is weird. The scene of them on the balcony is like really great. And her elevator scene is great. And I was going to say, that's my favorite Tom Hanks performance in the film, too. I think him is Isaac the scientist? But very brief performance. It's brief, yeah. but it's kind of like quintessential Hanks because it's and, the type of decency yeah, that's think, hard. To and those play. two have a really, really nice chemistry there. I just in think both you of those, brought songs. a lot of heart and soul to the London gangster. I just really, really appreciate what that's you a, did with that's that. a fair. No, I, I actually love Hanks throughout the movie. I love Hanks just throwing him. I, I love I watching him. And Jim Hanks. Broadbent. There's only one option, right? The blind musician. <laughs> oh, yeah. what's the option? What's the option, Bobby? Uh, whatever, whatever the guy's name um, is. In the, in the old Cavendish. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruddy Cavendish. Yeah, uh, Keith uh, David has to be in the Louise Ray storyline yeah. as like her like protector mm. defender. Hugo Weaving for me. Oh, is it's the gotta nurse. be. Oh no, <laughs> I'm gonna go the green. The I'm green. going green. You're going, going green. Goblin. Green Goblin. Uh, he would have been a good Green Goblin. Yeah, he'd be a great Green Goblin. Uh, good, good in the Spider Man. Uh, yeah. Who? No, I feel like there's Duna a major Bay. actor. Of, well, Duna Bay is wonderful. I yeah, think she should have been Oscar nominated. I agree. Sue yeah. me. Um, she's terrific. Yeah. I do feel like. Wait, isn't there uh, what's her name? Hugh Grant. Hugh oh, Grant. Oh, 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 yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Hugh now, Grant. I think Hugh Grant is an underrated actor I who obviously is like clearly a nightmare to work with and a really lazy actor who yes. does a lot of bad movies and only works with guys who butter him up, like Mark Waters but or whatever. He stretches but when himself you. Put him to the chat test. Yeah. He's good. That's what's weird. And he's is like good in this. Th- what's his, is his name? Mark Waters. That guy. Mark Waters is the guy who made like two weeks' notice and music. Right. And like in the last and, ten yeah. years, seventy-five percent of his films have been written directed by the same guy yeah. who did fucking two weeks' notice. Did you hear about the Morgans? Right. The <laughs> rewrite, which is the, the one that didn't even oh, come did out you theatrically. Hear about the, yeah, here. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was another one, music and lyrics. Music and lyrics. Yeah. He does like uh, one romantic yeah. comedy every three years with the same director. And he'll do like Richard Curtis. But he hasn't done that since Love Actually. Yeah, yeah, he like yeah. rarely. Uh, yeah, but this film, it's like you get a full meal. Like he's giving you like five different dishes. Well, so what's your favorite? Grant, I, Bobby? I, I mean, I liked him as the cannibal because it was just it was surprising for me. And it he was, was he made yeah. a good cannibal, but I think my favorite was h- him as the uh, nuclear guy in yeah. the Louis Way. He I made a, a very like deliciously like good, sleazy like, like yeah. CEO guy. Yeah. Yeah. Sinuous sort of performance. He was yeah. good. I was gonna I make a joke earlier. I forgot it, but that, in that segment, he's playing himself. <laughs> yeah, right. He's yeah. essentially yeah. just playing the evil version of like just with a with a fatter tie. Oh, you know, very yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, my favorite one is is him as fucking Broadbent's brother. Yeah, he's with he's the weird doing mega, something. Hey, there. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, as I'm out, comes out. Um, so this has been fun. It's amazing. Yeah. This has uh, been great. Bobby, we should all listen to Who Weekly. If you're not listening to Who Weekly, then Bobby's who great are podcast, you? <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else we have to plug? Uh, boo, 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 boo. Um, uh, I'm trying to think because this is going to come out so far in advance. That's true. Well, you're making the tick. I'm making the tick. At the time you're listening to this, I'm he's I'm probably the just tick. unless he's I'm been just no, finishing up. The tick. Um, <laughs> Don't even. Say yeah, that. I, I was you like, know, you know what? You know I'm not even going to make a silly joke about it. Yeah, you're going to yeah. be great. Uh, I'm still waiting for the day where they're. This like, is the last time we're probably going to record it until you'd make the tick. Uh, yeah. So, like, next time when you're on mic, we'll, you'll oh. probably have made the tip. This is a Saturday right now, and I start filming on Tuesday, and then yep. for two weeks, I'm not going to do anything else other than... Uh, make that tick. tick. Make that tick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm doing a show at Union Hall, my, my the Griffin Joe Holiday, Holiday Spectacular, show, yeah. on the 30th. Is it Memorial Day? At 7.30. That's the plan. We're going to memorialize Memorial Day after it's happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, thank it's, you. It's, like it's, that. it's moving. Yeah. That's moving. Uh, yes, but I believe it's Tuesday the 31st, May 31st at 7.30 at Union Hall. You and I are about to go see the shit out of Civil War. Yeah, which at this point will be a month old uh, when <laughs> you listen right. to this, so who fucking gives a shit? <laughs> hey! Yeah, but we're going to see the shit out of it. We saw X-Men Apocalypse lately, uh, yesterday. Late. Yeah, but the, the embargo doesn't lift till Monday. 
Yeah, but by the time I'm this joking, airs, it will have, it'll be about to come out in theaters. Yeah. You, I almost texted you last night just one more time saying the embargo doesn't lift till Monday. Can we share our opinions just because this could be a time capsule and it won't release? Uh, yeah, it's a dog shit movie. I give it a gentleman's <laughs> five. <laughs> yeah. Bad. Here's we my- can talk about it in more depth <laughs> later. I feel like yeah. uh, I, 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 even though the embargo has uh, not yet lifted. I just I, like I, the I, idea of fucking with the embargo because yeah. no one's going to hear this until now. Uh, my quick take on it is the X-Men are in it. They have pretty faces and they punch people. A gentleman's five. Yeah. It's really bad. It's an insulting movie. It's, it's watchable. It's very long. It is very long. In the end, it just stops. It becomes white noise. It stops making sense. Can you repeat what you told me when I asked? Uh, you said, you asked me, we were talking about people who didn't like. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah oh, yeah. yeah. You I said, I'll repeat the joke. joke. Repeat the I'll joke. Repeat the joke. Right. I'll repeat yeah. the joke. Okay. Uh, I, I liked X-Men Apocalypse. I thought it was fine. Yeah, you know it's not didn't. a great movie. You know who really didn't like X-Men Apocalypse? Who, who, who Griffin? Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> She has to deliver this big emotional monologue near Jesus, the end, and she Jesus delivers it Christ. like a, there's a gun being pointed yeah. at her. The, um, she's like, the Uber's outside right now. <laughs> You're promising me that the second I get this on film. As always, we got to wrap this up. Yes. Griffin. Yes. Cloud Atlas. Yeah. As always. I just realized we did cover like half of the plot. Like the, we, we didn't conclude any of the plot lines. What do you mean? We didn't get to the part where she finds out that they're like stripping the other clones and feeding the clones to oh, themselves. Oh, that's very Matrixy. Yeah. Well, there are three movies where people are being yeah, used we as about it. right and ju- an energy source for other people. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, we covered most of the plot lines. You know, they shoot the fucking signal into space, and you know, Tom Hanks get married movie. to Halle Berry. Good movie. Watch good movie. it. Be, be kind movie. to other people. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, you're the best. Thank you for being here. You guys ben, are the best. Ben, hey, please don't die. You guys die. are the best. Ben, oh my god. I just love Ben making Darth Vader noises in the background of this entire episode. Ben is, is this is it. This oh. might be Ben's last episode. No, I'll be back, but we You'll gotta be back stop. stronger uh, than ever. Yeah, we next, gotta stop. Next month, we're gonna read a, next month, next episode, we're gonna read a book report that someone sent in. We got a book report to the M. Night Shyamalan book, so look forward to that. Maybe I'll see a famo uh, eating a burger. Maybe I will. Uh, and, you know, commissary yeah. or whatever. Uh, and and as always, uh, buy the Cloud Atlas vinyl on eBay. <laughs> Do it. Do it. Griffin, why can't I find this one fucking? Oh my god! Which, whose whose line is it? Anyway, it's it's uh. Oh, I see what you. I, 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 that took a while. <laughs> these these bottles are all the rage. I see I, these bottles everywhere. I know. I know. It's I I jumped right into that trip. They're good, <laughs> you know. I'll leave it cold water. I leave it in a hot cod. It's still cold. Another another big, uh, in addition to Chick Fil A drive through, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Texans love. They love their Yeti tumblers. Have you heard of the Yeti tumbler? I have not. What is that? It's a brand of uh cooler, but also uh thermal technology mm-hmm. that keeps drinks very cold for a really long time. Okay. And so their their coolers are really expensive and they're really like bulky. Uh you be dropping a few hundred dollars for a cooler. You be dropping um like four or five hundred dollars mm-hmm. for a cooler. That's a lot of money right. for a cooler. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, okay, yes. fair enough. But it Texas uh, is a hot place, Texas. But so, yeah. The more affordable entry into the brand is the not that it's a tumbler. So you've got like your it's big and then it and it fits in the glove compartment. I mean, in, in a, a, not a, in a cup, holder? In cup holder. Wait, yeah. a so blog like, you're talking about? No, <laughs> it's a, it's a. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, I, it's probably it's probably thirty two ounces. Okay, and then it gets right. you know thin at the bottom. Right, right, right. Uh, it's like a soda they cup. Keep, sure. They keep it's a metallic lid and everything else is their like special technology. Mm-hmm. That's probably about seventy five dollars for your tumbler. You look in a car in in a parking lot, and a just lot of them will just them? have them. They've wow. got the lower end model that's maybe. 45 50 this is only like $35. And so a friend of mine, her father has one, and he was visiting her. Mm-hmm. He was like, I got my Yeti tumbler. I think his, his kids gave it to him for Christmas. He was like, I left my, I left it in the car. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I got back in the oh, car after work. I'm looking at him right now. And he was like, there was still ice in my water. And I was like, is that, like, what is that, Bennett? Like, <laughs> you're supposed is to that be really like, helping no. your life? <laughs> uh, okay, I couldn't find the one I was looking for. I found a different one. Uh, all right, we got to go. Yeah, Come we're on. starting right now. Yeah. Uh, ben, please put all that Yeti Tumblr uh, talk at the end of the episode. <laughs> oh, sure, no problem. Yeah. Okay, cool. Ready? Yeah. This has been a UCB Comedy production. Check out our other shows on the UCB Comedy Podcast Network. 